Welcome everyone to Deep Drinks Podcast, the deepest podcast on the internet. Today we have a panel and we're going to be talking about purity culture horror stories or purity culture in general. There's a trigger warning. We are going to be going in depth into uh, sexuality, um, how things have affected us um, sexually, like a lot of sex in this. We're talking about kinks. We're talking about all sorts of things. Nothing is off limits. Um, so please, if that stuff can kind of trigger you, uh, make sure you maybe um, be careful going forward or, or switch off or, or something like that. But um, trigger warning there. So I have a quick definition before we jump into it. Purity culture is a social and religious movement that promotes abstinence from sex until marriage and emphasizes the importance of maintaining sexual purity. While it may have positive intentions, there are several negative side effects associated with purity culture. The shame and guilt. Purity culture often instills a deep sense of shame and guilt in individuals who engage in sexual activity before marriage and outside of a monogamous relationship, which can lead to feelings of worthlessness and depression. Stigmatization. Individuals who uh, deviate from the norms of purity culture can be stigmatized, ostracized, or judged by the community, leading to social uh, isolation and mental health issues. A lack of sexual education. This is a big one. Um, purity culture often promotes absence-only sex education, which can lead to individuals without, comp uh, without a comprehensive understanding of safe sex practices. Consent and healthy relationships increasing the risk of unplanned pregnancies and sexual transmitted infections. Oh, um, objectification of women. So it's funny because it, it, it purity culture aims to try and not objectify women, but as a result, purity culture tends to focus disproportionately on women's purity and virginity, which can perpetuate harmful gender stereotypes and contribute to the objectification and devaluation of women and damaged relationships. The emphasis on sexual purity can create unrealistic expectations and pressure within relationships, leading to feelings of inadequ inadequacy, trust issues, and dissatisfaction. Difficulty in sexual identity and expression. Purity culture can limit individuals' ex exploration of their sexual identity, making it difficult for them to accept and express their authentic selves. And you see this a lot uh, with the uh, with uh, people who identify as trans and obviously LGBT. Um, me uh, mental health issues, the combination of shame, guilt, and repression associated with purity culture can contribute to anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues. And lastly, in the impact on sexual assault survivors. So purity culture emphasizes emphasis on virginity and purity can, can uh, be particularly damaging for survivors of sexual assault who may feel invalidated or even blame themselves for the assault. Uh, so today we aim for a cathartic and open panel. There is no shame guilt or judgment here no one's sexual identity gender expression preference or horror stories are to be judged please treat everyone both the panelists and each other in the deep drink comments uh with chat with uh respect uh that they deserve today we hope to have um an awesome discussion uh, on what on on the topics that once felt taboo to laugh at our experiences and to help others with our stories let's jump into it <laughs> Welcome everyone to the Deep Drinks panel. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm going to quickly just uh, get through the introductions. So I myself am Dan McDonald. I'm a former youth pastor, now agnostic atheist. I make content about religion, philosophy, and human rights. And today I'm drinking a scotch as well as some coffee, as well as Coke <laughs> and some water. So I've got them all, all the drinks here to really have a fun night. So um, that's me. Um, yeah. Stacy. Hi. You could introduce yourself. I'm apostasy. But my name is Stacy, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> drinking um, white wine Bacchus. Uh, I live in Vernon, British Columbia. It's wine country, so I'm drinking a local wine. Um, and I host a secular soapbox on Skeptic Haven Network on Wednesday nights. Um, and I just kind of do other shows, like I've done David's show. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I'm just enjoying doing the rounds of uh, interviews like this and getting, uh, helping people with like religious trauma. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to meet all of you, Dr. Ben. I've actually met you on my very first 
uh, yep. show a year ago. So it's so awesome to see you again, but it's wonderful to meet all of you. So thank you for having me, David. Next. Awesome. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. I, ben. <laughs> I guess I'm next. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Ben, uh, formerly known as student Dr. Ben, but I am a med school graduate. Uh, starting family medicine hey. residency uh, with the U.S. Army in June. Um, so lots of changes coming. I host my own show uh, called Medical Myths on Saturdays at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time, except for this week, because I'm actually recovering from top surgery right now. Uh, so I haven't been doing a whole lot of things <laughs> this week. Um, but there's that show. I also do a trivia night uh, on Twitch on uh, Fridays. And that's under Family Doctor Ben. All my handles now have changed to Family Doctor Ben. <laughs> uh, I'm also uh, a regular host of Talk Heathen with the ACA and uh, the Transatlantic Call-In Show on the Line. And you can find me kind of all over the place. I, I will be dialing back a little bit this next year because of residency, but uh, you can still find me occasionally in places. Awesome, awesome. awesome. Emily, the amazing Emily, who has an amazing <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily. I'm um, most known for my comedy and um, doing deconstruction advocacy under the name Feral Pastor's Wife. I'm currently sort of transitioning out of that space and back into real life, but this topic is one that I'm really, really passionate about. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with you all, and I'm drinking an Aperol Spritz. Ooh. Oh, I forgot to say what I was drinking. Oh, I, yeah. can't, <laughs> I can't have alcohol right now, so I have a rock star. Hey, because you that like are a, a rock star. Is, is that like a is that like a Red Bull ripoff like sort of drink? Is that like an energy drink? Yeah, so it's I, I ended up buying Rockstar because uh, it's cheaper by about I think it's about fifty cents cheaper than a Monster, and it's like a dollar <laughs> cheaper than a Red Bull, and it's got like double the caffeine. So <laughs> it's very I was like it is worth the money. It. <laughs> what what flavor? What flavor is that? It's a this black is and white the can. Rockstar Pure Zero Silver Ice. It is, I oh. think, citrus, some kind of citrus, vague citrus flavor. But it's got 240 milligrams of caffeine instead of 160. So it's worth the money, and 50 cents awesome. cheaper than Monster. So <laughs> awesome. Uh, and Emily, you're drinking an Aperol Spritz. You said, "Yes, sir." What is that? What is an Aperol Spritz? It's, um, well, Aperol, which is an aperitif uh, liqueur, and then champagne and a little bit of seltzer water. And garnished with an orange, if you're feeling crazy. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Okay, Nicole. And we know that Nicole always drinks the craziest drinks when she comes on Deep Drinks. It's, uh, <laughs> she's a wild one. <laughs> I'm wild. Today is Gatorade. <laughs> so, oh! Yay! That's, what... That's so funny. Um, I'm Nicole Mitchell. I've... I'm known as the pastor turned stripper. Um, I'm a top OnlyFans creator and I help people through life coaching. I either do one-on-one -on -one clients or teach live digital courses or through um, conversations and content in my OnlyFans to help people live their truest life and make a shit ton of money. So thank you for having me, David. <laughs> awesome. That's so good. Uh, and Jeremy. I'm Jeremy Schumacher. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, I have my own practice, Wellness with Jer. Um, so I work with couples. I have a specialty in religious trauma, which is kind of the overlap here. I was raised fundamentalist, so that's the other overlap here. I also have a random uh, specialty in sports performance. So I do couples counseling, religious trauma work, and sports performance. And I am drinking Jaeger and Red Bull. <laughs> um, so we got a, a wide range of classy beverages tonight. <laughs> so, Jeremy, you mentioned that your the the uh, the heating in your um, the office that you're in is gone out. So yeah, you might be freezing throughout this. So you'd be drinking more and more alcohol to try and just stay keep warm. having alcohol and you warm right up, right? That's <laughs> see, Jeremy has taken the classic Jaeger bomb and just drinking it as a cocktail, which is uh, <laughs> yeah. mixed drink. It's my favorite <laughs> beverage for the summer. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, guys, we need to, there's, there's a big problem, first of all, getting into this um, topic. And that is like, we need to make sure we're on the same level. And I have no idea what kind of purity culture you guys grew up with. Um, so I need to, I want to, I've got a bit of a test that we can do, a bit of a game <laughs> that can kind of put us in the, um, see where we're all at. Okay. So I need everyone 
to like close your eyes and try and imagine yourself as like the most purity culture, purity person that you were back when you maybe you attended church or whatever. And just, just put yourself in that, in, in you know, come to, to become that person again for the next five minutes. Uh, mm. And we're going to answer these questions. You can open your eyes now. We're going to answer okay. these questions. <laughs> um, and we're going to rank these sins. So everyone, you know, if you're a Christian, you probably grew up thinking that every sin is a sin and you're going to hell unless you accept Jesus and repent from your sins. But we, there was definitely a feeling in at least my uh, church that some sins were worse than others. So like kissing your girlfriend might have felt like a sin, um, but uh, like if you got too kissy or something, but um, sleeping with um, some uh, a bunch of people on one, like a football team, um, then then you would, uh, that would feel worse. So we're going to rank sexual sins. And uh, if you want to join in in the comments and uh, express your, uh the agreement or dissatisfaction then let us then please do that but here we go okay so here's the sexual sin tier list okay, okay. and uh emily your face is getting blocked by that so i'm going to remove <laughs> there we go so okay where are we going to put um i'm going to try i'm going to so everyone's going might have different opinions i'm going to try and uh i'm going to be the final voice um based on where you guys are kind of sitting okay. otherwise it'll take forever so <laughs> Talking about um, masturbation. So these are all AI heart generated um, imagery. <laughs> Let me zoom in. Uh, so, and it took me ages and I actually got banned from using the AI because <laughs> uh, I would type in like a bunch of shirtless people hugging and I'd be like, you're banned. And I got banned for like five minutes. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is the image that I come up with masturbation. So how, That's so we got, we got probably okay, but careful, meh, maybe a okay, a little sin, bad sin, very bad sin, hell bad sin. So, and that's the image. It's a lady looking at her hands. Uh, looks like she's praying. She looks like she's praying. Yeah. So where are we going to put that? On her knees, you know? That was bad sin. Yeah. yeah I was going to say think bad sin. Yeah, bad sin. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think okay. this, this level depends on how, if you're perceived as a man or a woman in the church, I think oh. it's different ah. for both. Yeah. So, do you think it was worse for women? women. To yeah, yeah, definitely women. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? I think I think most men were like, "It's bad, but we're gonna do it." You know, like they're <laughs> they were all kind of doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, just and just for reference, like um, back when I was a Christian, I was not out as trans, and I didn't even know what being trans was. So, all of my experience was as as a woman in the church, which is very weird um, you have the most yeah unique, i would agree with that unique perspective i think yeah, anyone definitely um okay all right so it's bad sin yeah i would mm -hmm. i would consider a bad sin as well in my mind um oh i was raised fundamentalist so all these are going to be hellbound sins for me you know just <laughs> okay <laughs> you thought about sex and you weren't married you're going to hell yeah. <laughs> okay looking at some of lust so i got this person with binoculars um, um meh yeah. Meh. Meh? I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's meh. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. I think so as well. Uh, pornography. Now, look at this image. Oh, that is... oh that's a very, very, very bad. bad. Very bad. Very bad, mm -hmm. <laughs> very bad scene. Okay. Very bad. I wonder if I can zoom in a bit more. Oh, I, uh, <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll post these. these. I'll post crazy. Some of these. Yeah, these are I'll such good some... pictures. <laughs> I know. I love that. You look so happy. I love that picture. <laughs> You should see the prompts that I used for, for these. <laughs> did anybody else, like, did any of your parents, like, uh, make you get a, a, like, a safety browser so that you wouldn't be caught watching porn? Covenant eyes, right? That's yeah. Covenant eyes. <laughs> yep. Oh, I yeah. like Jeremy and I came from similar backgrounds because I was <laughs> fundy evangelical too. Well, then I did I did therapy yeah. <laughs> at a Christian. When I started out my practice, I was still a Christian. And so I worked at a Christian counseling place. So like I had all these guys who found me because I was a male therapist. So I had all the porn cases because oh they don't want to go see a lady therapist. <laughs> they got to go talk to a dude about it. So it's like every man's battle and all this stuff. So I have like my personal experience. And then like how many porn cases <laughs> did I work with? Yeah, exactly. So covenant yeah. eyes, people being like, can I have you be my accountability person? I was like, no. Mm. Oh, maybe your pastor <laughs> would be good for that. I don't I don't want that. Thanks, though. 
That's I think amazing. in my Baptist church, people <clears throat> just assumed that women weren't doing it. And so none of the parents were scared about their daughters masturbating or watching porn, even though obviously it's happening, you know, but I don't think that that was very well known. I was going to ask, like, um, do like what age do you, uh, I don't know if girls talk about this, but what age do get, like, definitely dudes do. Like when I was like 12, we're like, do you know, if you touch your dick, you do, it feels good. <laughs> but what, uh, what do girls talk about this? Like talk about masturbation habits or anything like that? Or uh, is it kind of like, you know, those habits that. didn't cross my mind until college, but I think I was a late bloomer in that aspect. Yeah. Oh, I okay. started when I was like five. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I did it when I was really young. I just didn't know what it was. Uh, and like, no, and you no, can get away with doing it in ways that aren't obvious either. So you can like, <laughs> like when you're a kid and don't know what it is, like you can have fun anywhere because nobody knows what you're doing. Yeah, which is normal and healthy sexual development for children. <laughs> hey, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Dropping that in. Okay. Um, so now we've got um, um, uh, fornication. So which is the image I use for fornication? Uh, oh, it's this image. Fornication. So people meeting in a nightclub and that's the only one I could think of to get. Very bad. Uh, very bad? I'd say very yeah, bad. Very bad. Very bad. Okay. Okay. And that's that's New Testament. It's outlawed right there. <laughs> yeah. It's supposed to fornicate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is where it's a little little bit fun because I think this actually goes into the realm of like marriage as well. So you're in a healthy monogamous relationship. What happens when your partner or someone or you want to try butt stuff? Is butt stuff still a <laughs> sin when you're <clears throat> in uh, in marriage? Oh, I was taught that that, that it is. Death and I, I don't. Yeah. I don't. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. <laughs> I think if it's still within the confines of marriage, it's not as bad in, in at least my church's eyes. Yeah, I was told that like once you're married, kind of anything is okay within okay. The, in the marriage bed. But I was still not. I, yeah, I was a little too uptight about anything like that. So mm. I still would have felt guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh... So we need maybe, a Mormon. Uh, we need like a Mormon on the the panel because they <laughs> they had like all the they have all the cool like loopholes like uh, the poop hole loophole is the like you don't break your virginity. <laughs> soaking, uh, yeah. soaking, yeah, that's the other one. <laughs> or like as long as you're not thrusting, it's not really sex. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So uh, let's put it in. Let's wait, should we go meh? Or yeah. I'll, I'll say okay. meh. Probably say okay. Meh. Okay. okay. Yeah. Meh. Uh, yeah, if if they're married, then yeah, it's one of those. What two. is the picture of but exactly? You're moving it so It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a lady it's holding peach. a peach. Okay, smiling. has anyone seen that movie? Um, Call me by your name. <laughs> yeah. No. What's I that? I can't look at peaches the same after that. Movie. <laughs> right. Right. Just go watch the movie. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. Homosexual <laughs> attraction. So just being attracted to someone. Uh, oh, oh hellbound. It's like hellbound, hellbound or very hellbound. Bound. Just being attracted. Hellbound. Just being attracted, not having sex. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. just being attracted is very bad for me. Not very hellbound, bad. but acting on it. It's either, it, it's at minimum yeah. very bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because awesome. what I've okay. heard is attraction isn't a sin, but acting on the temptation exactly. is a sin. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. attraction is the temptation. Mm -hmm. And it's more about like yeah. it's also more about how it feels. Like so, uh, um, like it, like how how wrong it kind of feels in that purity culture kind of mindset um, as well. Because uh, a lot of this is very subjective, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, which one did I choose? Homosexual sex. So hellbound. 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 Oh okay. yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, oral sex. <laughs> look at this. Sorry. Oh, look at this. Oh image. my gosh. <laughs> Look at this image down here. It's... <laughs> what is that? Wow. No, that's a papaya. Eating... A papaya, that's yeah. A papaya. So, so outside of marriage, we'll say <clears throat> oral sex. Oh, outside of marriage? Th yeah. That makes oh, a huge difference. That's very, uh... very bad. So... Bad sin or very bad? Probably. It's either bad or very bad. Let's say bad. I think bad sin. Yeah, okay. And I'll we'll just zoom in so everyone can get a good look at the... And just so you know, it was only ever about, like, with penises. There was never a conversation about oral sex for vaginas. So, like, 
that's well, like that's why already included in that. Mm. I tried to be so I, I typed in man licking <laughs> papaya <laughs> because I tried to make it ex inclusive. I, I appreciate. I saw that. I appreciate. <laughs> it wasn't inclusive growing up. <laughs> Uh, That's awesome. hilarious. Uh, okay, kinky sex positions. So we'll do this inside of marriage. So oh. I know some people are like I would never do doggy style. I think it's um, perverted or wrong or whatever. Um, I had I had those conversations with people growing up. So where would we put but this image Where's here? Is I think probably okay. I, I'd say probably okay. Probably okay in, in the yeah. confines of marriage. Yes. Yeah, it, within marriage, yeah. I'd say okay. So we got, um, so we got probably okay, but, but but be careful because there's like the, the, I wanted to emphasize the point that you never really feel like something's a okay. Like you just like there's always a little bit of doubt. Like what if I'm doing something wrong? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, uh, okay, group sex. So this is the image I use for group sex. <laughs> oh, help out! Oh, that's help out. That's help out for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, that's a nice little uh, group hug. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. Uh, sexting. So oh. got someone under the sheets here. Sexting. I'd say unmarried. Uh, yeah. Unmarried. Or even married. Bad mean, or are bad. pictures involved or is it all I think verbal? Bad. No, no pictures. Just set, just text. Just like. Mm. Bad. Very bad. I'd say bad. probably bad. I'd say like that's to me, I, I would have been told like that's kind of committing adultery. Within oh, my okay. friend, like that would be you're 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 crossing a line. You've already committed adultery. <laughs> That's what I yeah. would have been told. Yeah. Well, that would have been where, bad. Where would you put I it? Very like, bad. I would have put that at very very bad. Mm. Interesting. But I mean, you don't have to put it on mine. But that's just what. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So you can put it um, at bad, but. Well, let's. I'll put. Um, what about uh, the next one? Is sending nudes, and and I couldn't get a nude photo. I just have a dude looking in a mirror, <laughs> um, taking a selfie. So married or unmarried? Very bad. Uh, I'd say very we'll go bad. unmarried. Then very bad. Very bad. Very bad. Mm -hmm. Very bad. Yeah. Okay. Um heavy kissing in outside of marriage. Probably okay. Yeah, I'd say okay. Yeah, okay. Probably okay. Okay, okay. Um dry humping. And I just got like a pile of sand here because all <laughs> I remember from dry humping is the rashes mm. and the <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little sin. A little sin. Maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe a little baby sin. sin. Yeah, okay, a little baby sin. Baby sin. Uh, soaking. So this is the, what you mentioned before. Oh. And I've got a sponge soaking <laughs> in water. So can someone explain what soaking is? That's where uh, a penis is in a vagina, but there's no thrusting. And then uh, I think what the cool kids are doing is they have other people like stand on the bed and like move the bed so mm. that you're totally stationary. The people... Penis and vagina is not moving, but there's then they're uh, skidding yeah. movement. Sounds somehow. like group sex. In People a way. are moving the bed. I mean, yes. that's what the cool kids are doing. I think I don't know. Yeah, if that's it's like the idea works. is like it's it's the way you get around it. So it's like you tripped and fell into your partner, which is what? right, and then and then you're not moving, so you're not having sex, and then someone else jumps on the bed, so it makes the movement of you guys moving. Um, so you're not in control. Oh my. Yeah, and I See, guess at the end they just like know that's my not upbringing okay. would say that this would still be hellbound because it's still genital sex. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think very bad, very bad. I think so. that still would have been considered yeah hellbound for me, but outside of yeah, marriage or inside but is of marriage. It, I think it has to. Well, it can't be higher than than just uh, premarital sex. Surely, yeah. like because it's like, still, no, like, very still bad intercourse, is. but okay. yeah. yeah, but that is okay. premarital sex, right? Like, yeah, 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 that, yeah, that, yeah, I yeah think on is. the same level, yeah. yeah, 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 it's yeah, uh, contraception. So, this is someone something someone brought up who I think was a Catholic or maybe still is a Catholic, but taking the pill or using protection, um, let's let's pretend, let, let's say, like, obviously, before your um, uh, maybe before your marriage, just like. You know, you're preparing for sex, I guess. So, uh, oh, yeah, I know, I know my my oh, yeah. wife, my wife got caught hooking up with someone when she was um, like 11 or 13 or something, really young. Um, and uh, her mom's like, "That's it, you're going on the pill." And you know, she went on the pill like straight away, just you know. But there's some people who believe that even preparing like that is a sin. Yes, it's like yes see, I. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Well, see, I but... was I was told that contraception is the same thing as having an abortion and therefore the same thing as murder. 
That's so, what I was going to say. It's not just yeah. a sin when it's preparation. Even if it is for purely contraceptive purposes, some people still believe that it is a sin because you're preventing that seed. Yeah. Yeah. What what about condoms though? Like would that be That wouldn't be the same uh because okay. what I was told was that because you're preventing implantation, that's like you're causing an abortion. So like oh, okay. a, con a condom wouldn't do that. Um, yeah. So that would mm. be different. Okay. So where would we put just like someone using protection for protection's sake? Is it like a meh or is it like a... Mine would be bad because you've thought it out. Bad. Dead. I think yeah. meh. I think like, it depends um, on the, the sex just... too because like Catholics are anti like sex is just yeah. for procreation. So then you're like mm. going against God's yeah, will. I'd, so that's, I'd that's say pretty bad. bad. I put it as bad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wet dreams. So I know that you don't have any control over it, but I know that some people would feel guilty about having a wet dream. That guy looks like he is shitting his pants. <laughs> <laughs> I typed in a man wakes up uh, in uh, a man wakes up shocked and in a wet bed, <laughs> and it just this is what it come up with. So is that uh, a meh? No, or probably it's okay. Or would you would someone feel would you feel <laughs> guilty like if you had a wet dream? It's one of those like, two. I wouldn't put it any. I don't think higher, you, yeah. you can't mm. control that. And, so. and not so just wet dreams. Probably but like okay. if, if if a girl has like a sexy dream or something, you know, um, or uh, yeah, what qualifies the wet dream? Like, is it just a yeah? Sexy just like dream? if you have a, I guess if you have like a sexy dream, yeah. I, yeah, I still feel guilty. <laughs> Yeah, I'd feel it's guilty, nice. but I probably, probably okay, but be careful, as in, like, the you can't control it, but you'd still never feel good about it. Yeah, exactly. I went to my church for prayer mm. because of my sexy dreams. Like, in my Oh, really? And asked for, like, they, like, laid hands on me to, like, heal me. Did you get rid of the, did you, did you believe it was, like, demonic? It or like Um, because I think I believed it. I think I, like, you know, I believed in the, the psychology Psych of it. So, for, like, two years, I used to have every single month. And then for two years, wow. I didn't have any sexy dreams. And I was like, thank God I'm like finally safe. Cause I thought my fear was they were so hot that I, it made me want to do them. <laughs> so if I can so heal good. myself from them and not <laughs> think about it, then I'm probably not going to, oh my God. So I think if I had told a small group leader that I had had like a wet dream or like a sexy dream, they would have said that it was a heart problem. Like I'm not oh. good with God in some way. Like impure oh. in some way. Yeah. Mm hmm Jeez, and you, this, we, uh, Emily, were you in a Baptist church? Did you say? I was Southern Baptist. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, it feels a bit. I think it's a bit different how they approach things. Mm. It sounds. Um. Okay. Back to the list. Um. So, uh, giving a front hug. So we used to have. Okay. This is this is just a bit of a funny story, but we used to have the the Christian side hug. You go up to your, your, the friends of opposite sex church and you give them the Christian side hug. And it's so funny. One of my friends, um, he was a Christian, but he was just, he was a bit edgy. And he goes, he goes, I hate the Christian side hug. And he's like, I like the satanic front hug. And he grabbed me and just put our groins together and just like, you know, so, and he's like, I like the satanic front hug. And I was like, yeah. Take what you can get. Take what you yeah. can get. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, 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 hug, so hugging, um, so hugging just front on is probably a, okay. How is long it, is it lasting? <laughs> Uh, yeah, these yeah. people look like they're embraced for like a like they're, they're enjoying it. It's not like a goodbye hug. That's it's, a like a, it's, it's probably okay, but you got to make sure that like you've established that you're not going to go any farther than a kiss. Like you got to specify yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Are like upstairs and you downstairs in contact? <laughs> uh, like, like, is it um, like this? Like they're hugging like this or are they like this? Then, okay, That's we're talking true. yeah high school dancing where we're arms length yeah, apart. Not like not like this, but more like this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, got it. Oh my god. So like a meh? I'd say probably okay, but be careful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's something I don't think they'd get mad at you for actually as long as you were in a relationship, like it's okay, but they'd be like, just be careful that you don't go any farther than than a kiss. Like yeah, you'd get yeah. lectured about it, but you wouldn't be told explicitly that it was a sin. Our uh, our edgy high school rebellion, a bunch of the guy friends that I had in high school, we all hugged uh, and like would kiss each other on the cheek. And we got like pulled into the office at one point to be like, all right, you guys, like whatever you're trying to do, you need to stop. It's distracting. <laughs> 
And we're like, oh, sorry. But like, yeah, for us, that was like edgy for like two dudes to be hugging. And then like we escalated to a peck on the cheek. And like, that's what got us in trouble. One of my um... friends. Go. One of my friends had very similar behavior with his guy best friend. You know, it's just like, I don't know. It was like a weird bro love between them, like a bromance. And they were both camp counselors. And one of them got told to go home that he couldn't counsel the kids anymore because that, that, uh, activity was like too dangerous to be around kids hmm. we, we wow. had um we, we had gay chicken at my school which was like you'd go in for a kiss and the first one to pull out was like um the gay chicken right but um but everyone was doing it like so everyone was running around just pretending to kiss each other it was like a really <laughs> weird time um okay and last two let's get through these erotic fiction so uh women oh. or men reading erotic fiction like bad scent or very yeah, bad, bad for me. Yeah. Bad. Uh-huh. bad. It depends though, because for me in high school, like Fault in Our Stars would have been erotic fiction to like a ninth <laughs> grader. So I don't know because nobody would yeah. lecture me yeah. for that. The other thing is like, I guess it, it matters too on is it heterosexual or is it homosexual? Because Ooh. if it's homosexual mm. fiction, go in hell. It's hell Straight to hell. Yeah. Yeah. Hell- mm. 100%. If it's heterosexual media, then, you know, just be careful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let's leave it. Let's put a lid. That's the very bad, bad scene because yeah. it's the, yeah, because of the homosexual aspect as well. And last one is manual sex. So fingering and hand jobs and things like that. Ooh. And I got a, uh, an, an Asian lady, it looks like, holding <laughs> a bunch of um, eggplants um, <laughs> and smiling. Okay. Are they married He's, or unmarried? Unmarried. Unmarried. Okay. Okay. I would say very bad. So it's but we've had oral sex is bad. Okay, we can put it at at bad then. Yeah. I think men, because oral sex would be a step above that. Should we bump up oral sex? I think oral sex should be very bad. Mm. And then hand jobs and all that bad. (laughs) Okay. So what what do we have as progressive Christians? So hellbound is group sex and homosexual sex. Okay. But not yeah. premarital sex in there? No, we should put premarital sex, sex I think, as I think so. I think, yeah. I think that needs to escalate. Yeah, yeah, those are like the top three for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, I definitely feel like um, there needs to be like a tier above this, like hellbound but gay, and then the gay stuff is definitely more definitely feel because like premarital sex, you're yeah. you're committing the premarital sex part uh, if you you have gay sex, but then you're bumping it up a notch because it's gay as well, and which is a no no, right? So like, yeah, yeah, it's a hard one. As long I mean, as you're in a cis hetero relationship, it's never going to be as bad as it could yeah. be. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. could just you could just make a whole different chart that's like all of these but gay and just like put them all up. <laughs> and they all just go up one like Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, um well, at least we know where we're at. I'm going to save that. I'm going to download it. Um well, uh, awesome and uh, and I'll share it with everyone. But uh yeah, guys, so how did you how did everyone first learn about purity culture? Let's jump into this discussion because we're already half an hour in, which is just crazy. That was fun. But... When did you when did you guys first learn about pretty culture? And welcome everyone uh, who's in the chat. I can see your comments and thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Oh. Um well who wants to go first? <laughs> you can go first. I mean, I was Yeah, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. No, you yeah, go, Jeremy. Ask- I was raised fundamentalist, uh, but you know, you never call yourself a fundamentalist. The yeah. fundamentalists always are like, no, like that other group is crazier than us. Yeah. Um, hmm. So I was evangelical Lutheran. So like everybody I interacted with growing up was also evangelical Lutheran. So like my frame of reference was just like, this is normal. Mm-hmm. And then I went to the University of Minnesota, which is a big 10 uh, university, 60,000 students, public university. And like the second or third night there, my roommate's like, dude, if I put a sock on the door handle, that means I'm like having sex with my girlfriend. And I was like, very cool. I'm going to pretend like I am aware of this happening. And uh, so that was like the first time I was like, oh, like, shit, was this like my upbringing not normal? (laughs) Uh, And then like I studied psychology. So then I was like, oh, like everything about like my religious upbringing was not based on science and like pretty unhealthy for me. So it was like really my education was very late, like college and then like learning what should have happened and then reflecting back and being like, oh, gosh, like, yeah, we did the opposite or like 
made it so much worse than it needed to be. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'd say for me, I kind of put my the pressure on myself because I found out when I was younger that everyone in my family was pregnant when they got married. So I just decided, oh, okay, well, I don't want to do that. Um, not because anyone told me to do that. And then because I kind of made that decision when I got involved with youth group um, in the late 90s, uh, they were all talking about purity culture and we went to acquire the fire and they had the, the purity pledges for us to sign. So it kind of already aligned with what I was thinking as far as just not wanting to be pregnant uh, when I got married. So uh, I just sort of was like, yeah, that's the the route I will take. And I stayed very firm in that belief. Um, and I didn't do anything wrong um, throughout my whole teenage years as far as sex goes. And um, I, everyone I dated, I, I was very honest from the beginning, like I'm staying a virgin until I'm married. And every guy I dated thought, oh yeah, that's fine. But they, you know, they would try to push the envelope and get me to sort of cave. And, um, I met my husband at 20 and I really wanted to kind of not stick to that decision. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> cause I thought, oh, he's so great. And, um, we found our ways around that. And, um, it wasn't until just this past summer, I realized, oh my goodness, I don't think I actually was a virgin and <laughs> cause we, we, oh, found, really? we found loopholes. Yeah yeah. 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 Um, and I, I don't care, but, um, anyways, but I, I, yeah. I was the same in that, like m my wife and I, we, uh, I, I had slept with a couple of people, um, prior to being with Amy, um, but uh like a high school girlfriend and a one night stand pretty much but then we we waited till we were married to have sex but we the but the shit that we did outside <laughs> of sex like some porn stars don't do like we were like we were like going i feel like it's like i feel like it's like what is it that old quote it's like the hungry man eat, dreams of eating a horse but the rich man thinks of what food he'll eat it's like that that it was almost like that time in our life was funner than any other time in our life because we knew it was like it's like the 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 naughtiness of it like made it funner i, yeah. I, don't, I don't know it's funny because yeah. all i say to him now since like deconverting and deconstructing i'm like i'm so sorry we should have just done it because we've been <laughs> together 19 years now and he's like why are you apologizing we had an amazing time <laughs> yeah so, yeah yeah you know we had to find ways but yeah anyways yeah. I, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Ben. Um, so I have a kind of unique experience. I so I was born in the 90s. So like right when all that was just starting, but then it just kind of catapulted all of like youth ministry up till when I was in um like middle school and high school. And and I was raised fundamentalist evangelical. Um and like we had kind of every year they would have at youth group like a sex talk and like a purity talk and like everyone I knew had purity rings. People had like the purity pledges and all like all that was so common. Like I even remember talks with my parents about like, hey, you just shouldn't even date in high school because you're just going to be heartbroken and just wait until you're actually ready to commit to a marriage and all that. So like that was just how I was raised. Um, but thinking back on it is, is very weird because you'd have like these purity talks about like, don't do the sex and stuff. But like, it never really occurred to me that it would even be an issue for me because I was never attracted to heterosexual men. So it was like, I don't feel this attraction for any of these people. Like, I don't get why people are out there having premarital sex and things because I just don't get why any of this is appealing to them. <laughs> and uh, my my little gay ass didn't understand that being gay was a thing or being trans was a thing because it turns out that uh, as soon as it, like w when I was in college and finally had met queer communities and, and this was even before I like, because I started engaging in 
homosexual relationships before I even knew I was trans. But like the second I had start, started learning that, oh, the feelings that I had in like middle school and high school for, for girls, it was not that I just wanted to be their best friend. I thought I just wanted to be their best friend. I was like, hold on, this is what a crush feels like. Like this is the feeling that everyone else had back in like it, in adolescence that I also had, I just didn't know how to process any of it because I was told you can't, you can't be that. And then now like unpacking not only that attraction, but also because uh, testosterone has made me interested in men, but not, not <laughs> heterosexual so men, That's... only gay men, which is fitting because I am not, I'm not even in the dating pool for heterosexual men. So it's, it's a whole weird experience, but like, um, I don't, I don't know. It, it's such a mind fuck for, <laughs> for me and my purity culture journey. But anyway, uh, I'm, I guess I'll talk more about all my, my weird background later, but that's kind of how I got into this. And it's just been a, a whirlwind <laughs> ever since. <laughs> It's a, I just want to say, like, you, you talk about that on on your episode of Deep Drinks when you came on, but it's so amazing to me that you're like, okay, I'm gay, and then you start taking tea, and you're like, actually, you know, I, I like kind of everyone, I, you know, and it was like, it, I don't know, it's just, it's so, it's like, that must be, uh, like, so interesting, like, such an interesting dynamic there, like, it's such an interesting thing to happen. I was just going to say, uh, I feel like when it came to purity culture, it's just like the the water I swam in. You know what I mean? It's like the natural evolution for the evangelical circles where like you're just raised to be a good Christian and follow these rules and then came purity culture. And it was just like no different. It's like all I knew. I thought that was normal. I thought that was right. I thought it was appropriate. I bought it hook, line and sinker all the way through. I was like the poster child for purity culture, um, had the pledge card, had the ring, still very sexual and still had sex. And then it was just um, riddled with guilt mm -hmm. and shame and just like self-deprecation and like self-hate for like believing this so strongly and being unable to uphold or adhere to it. It just made me hate myself and took all the pleasure I could have had through my sexual experiences because A, I was already doing something bad and then to enjoy it was even like doubly bad. Um, and I didn't realize until um, decades later um, what it robbed from me and how harmful and damaging it was and um, how I'm so glad we're phasing out of that. and teaching young people to do differently and to do it better. Mm. And I will say, Dr. Ben, I was the same way where like, I didn't know I was queer growing up and I loved everyone. And I'm like, I'm just such a loving person. Like I just really <laughs> love all kinds of humans having no ideas like pansexual. And like, I'm just attracted to all the genders and all the orientations. I'm like, I'm just such a loving person. I'm like, oh wait, I want to fuck most people. Got yeah. it. <laughs> Slightly different. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> uh, Emily, how about yourself? How, how did purity culture like first manifest in your life? Um, you know, I have a really interesting, I think, background compared to most evangelical or fundamental people that I've met. I I made the choice to enter the church when I was in middle school, um, and I had my family follow me, and so the presence of purity culture in my life was sort of a gradual, sorry, my dog. Sorry if you guys can hear that. I'm just gonna keep talking. Um, Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> it was such a gradual crescendo and then decrescendo into college. And so high school was just, it was blindingly loud. And I am um, to the point where I look back now and I'm like, man, I took myself to Lifeway Christian Bookstore and bought myself a purity ring like that. Mm. I, I can't fathom that now. And I don't really remember when I snapped out of it. I think, you know, you step outside of the bubble and you start getting more, more exposure to other people and other experiences and lifestyles that you just kind of fade out of it. Um, mm. But I'm still unearthing the consequences of it even now every day. Mm. Someone in the chat, um, I won't mention who, but someone I know who's probably watching, they might might have ducked out for a second, but they are someone who I signed their purity certificate. So they printed a purity certificate that I'll, so I, like by themselves, they took an initiative by, by themselves. I was their, their small group leader and mm -hmm. myself and someone else signed their thing saying, I will wait till marriage to have sex. And they got like themselves a ring and, and everything like that. Um, so, but they're, they're happily fornicating now. 
Um, <laughs> Yay! Second, that's sex, why. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Sex was so taboo for like the religious group I grew up in that like the the purity culture stuff. Like when we became aware of it, like we were like, oh, that's weird. Like why are they doing that? Like you shouldn't even be thinking about sex because like that's like how like fundamentalists we were and then being like but those people are fundamentalists we don't we're not fundamentalists they're the weird ones like it mm. was so bizarre looking back on it like yeah we just didn't know literally anything yeah it's uh it's it's wild how it like the the i interviewed someone who uh they're part of a hasidic jewish cult and they, their purity culture is like next level and um they don't learn about what sex is or where babies come from until weeks away from their marriage. They yeah. they don't know that a penis goes into a vagina. They don't know anything. Um, and mm. uh, and there's like tragically a lot of them. Uh, there were there were three cases of in New York of um, there was this hotel that they all use for their wedding night. The, the next day um, uh, after the wedding night, um, you know there were three cases of women throwing themselves off the roof because they just were so traumatized by the by the experience. And that's part of why like we laugh about it and we're laughing about it because it's um not about that but about purity culture in general because it's cathartic it's helpful it's um it's healing but this stuff can be very serious like this can this affects it affects my life even to this day um and uh yeah there's um there's a while where um just to pivot from that to a little bit about me but the the uh i had so much shame and guilt around sex pornography the need to confess to everyone M my wife and i started our relationship with me confessing to her every time i would stuff up by looking at porn like she was some sort of bishop and i was like oh, i have made a mistake again um like please forgive me. like I, I just it was not and she was like please stop telling me she's like i don't care like don't, just like just move on with your day like oh, I'm, I'm sorry like please stop telling me it's like just annoying yeah. um so but yeah so and and that that guilt and shame carried into our uh, marriage when we got married so we got married and we would have sex and I would have anxiety around sex even after we were married. And nine times out of 10, I would have anxiety before or after sex. And it was horrible. Um, and even now, like it's uh, something I struggle with like, after 10 years, like I'll, I'll feel this guilt or this, or this uh, anxiety about, about it. Yeah. It's weird. Um, I was actually going to just say that I feel like purity culture affected me even more after marriage than it did prior oh. to marriage um because I agree. yeah i felt um even though like my husband and i before we got married we found those little loopholes and i still felt that tiny bit of guilt but i knew i was going to be spending the rest of my life with this person mm -hmm. so i kind of made it like that's how i sort of made it okay in my mind um mm -hmm. but after we got married um and i knew this is my husband everything's okay even in the act of having sex, I would be telling myself as it was happening, it's okay, you're allowed to do this now, it's fine, even though we had like known each other for two years. and um, But I would have to talk myself through it. And there, were, I remember one time, like when we were newly married, after we were done, I was just kind of like, and my husband's an amazing person. He was, he's never pressured me even before we got married. He never once pressured me to have, I, I hate saying intercourse, but just for the context of this conversation, I want, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. just say that he never once pressured me into having like actual intercourse um, prior to marriage. But after we had like sex this one time, like I just was like, oh my gosh, I think I even cried because I just was like, is this okay? Like I was 22 when we got married and um, we did have a short engagement because I was like, Hey, we're engaged. Let's do it. I want to get married. I've been waiting for this. Right. Yeah. Um, but it took a lot of just like a talking myself through it. Um, even though I was so excited and I had a really healthy view of sex because my mom, like, I'm the one who really put this pressure on myself. My mom never put it on me and she always wanted me to like view sex as a really amazing thing. Um, so I feel like it affected me more after marriage. Um, wow. And 
Yeah. So I, yeah, that's just one of the, I made a couple of notes in preparation for this. And I also felt like the need to confess. So I would even go tell my mom, like we had sex and she's like, it's fine. You're allowed. You're married now. Like it's totally okay. And then one time they, like my parents even took us to Mexico with them and treated us to this beautiful resort and, um, the way that the, the hotel was, um, the, places where they were above us and we were below and I didn't want to have sex and the room was gorgeous. And, and I remember sitting on the beach with my mom and she's like, these rooms are designed for you to have sex, have sex with your husband. <laughs> and I was like, okay. But I was like, you're above us. And she's like, I don't care. But it was just, <laughs> I had to wrestle with this whole, oh. yeah. So it, it, it's hard like to be like, it's okay to do this now. So We've been married yeah, for almost 17 years now, so I'm kind of over it. Um, I've worked it through, but those early years were tough. Yeah, your mom is uh, in the chat, I think, as well. Um, yeah, she uh, is. I, I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of your yeah, mom. She's cool. Yeah. There's been times where she's literally told me, like, we've had arguments, or not arguments, but just she'll even say, when was the last time you and Brian had sex? And I'll say, it's been a while. She's like, you need to go. like, have, And so... <laughs> She's saved. She's she's been a great advocate for us, but yeah. Oh, uh, awesome! So, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I got the a uh, two dollar super chat from River City Friends who said, <laughs> "Thanks for supporting my purity journey." So, yes, that was the person. Uh, he added himself now. Uh, he, he was the person who uh, who I signed the purity ring for. Is it true? <laughs> is it true, River City Film, that you threw the ring in like the water or something? Like you, I can't remember the story fully, but um, you should tell it in the chat. Um, a hundred percent. Um, I want to share everyone a quick clip as we um, uh, just a quick clip from every young man's battle. So every young man's battle is a book that I think is cancerous to the mind. Um, I kept it uh, just, I didn't want to keep it, but I decided to keep it, but uh, they had an, an accompanying a DVD that went with it. And I found, um, a I found it on YouTube and I, and I used to watch this back in the day. And this one little interview, this one little section that I'm about to show, um, scared me uh, a lot and made me think, I remember, I remember talking to my um, secular friends about, oh, I've got an addiction to pornography or I just can't stop. Like, I'm just like, I'm filled with lust. And they're like, what are you talking Like, dog, everyone like, watches porn what are you talking about and i'm like oh and i was like and i said to someone it was a joke but i was like i just don't want to end up um behind a pub uh giving someone a hand job or something like that like it was a joke <laughs> but the the concept of you know your pornography masturbation pornography will like you'll, t you'll turn into this like monster where you will you'll lose everything and it's it's almost like a heroin addiction uh so i um so and that I think that that fear comes partly from this clip. So let me show you this clip from the Every Young Man's Battle DVD. And let me know if you can hear it. Can everyone hear it? Mm -hmm. It started out magazines and movies, and then um, with sexual partners watching pornography, um, it just grew into something that I was unable to stop. Once you pick up the pornography, you won't be able to set it down. You won't be able to leave it alone. It's something that that's across the room. You're going to glance at it and keep looking at it. And it just grows. Um, your desire for the pornography increases to a point that it becomes uncontrollable or unstoppable. And the decisions you make once involved with it, I mean, can ultimately change your entire life. You lose your family. You realize how much you hurt. And I used to, I used to hear my mom say, sorry, that how much she hurt inside. And I never realized how much it was until I spent the last year not being able to see her or talk to her. And now that I understand what that pain that I caused her is like to feel, it makes you want to change more than anything I can think of is you lose someone you love over something you've done. It hurts not only them, but you. And pornography played the major role in losing my family, my friends. Um, there's a lot of people right now I can't even call. They were showing us the phone and he said, you can call family or friends. 
right now I have no friends that I would want to call and I have no family to call. <laughs> and it's like, Oh my gosh. So, many so Nicole, how do you feel about <laughs> having destroyed the lives of all of these helpless men? <laughs> You're profiting off of their misery, Nicole. Yes, I feel like I've blessed their lives. Their family like, won't speak to them. Yes. Like even the phrase, like he prostituted his body, he's completely bankrupt. It's such an exaggeration or extreme to like instill fear because as I watch this, I don't know anything about that book or his journey. I'm like, I want to see the rest of his life. I just want mm -hmm. to see his general de decision making skills as a whole because it's easy to pick one thing and make porn the evil thing when it's like, it sounds like he's just an unhealthy person who makes unhealthy mm -hmm. decisions, but they pin it all on porn or something sexual. And so it's just like, it's so unfair and such a biased perspective and obviously has like whore phobia all woven into that. Cause I think sex work is amazing and incredibly healing can be. So yeah, so many, so many triggers with that. It, it's, <laughs> uh, yeah. And I should have, said Sorry. extra trigger warning for that but it's it's uh it's it's not that like y there's no way he ended up where he was because of pornography but it the, like obviously it's probably a bunch of other things that went along with it but he's associating that all to like this yeah. this uh this rush with pornography or whatever there's <laughs> definitely a conversation to be had about like um about like um uh, responsibility around like how much like there are people who get uh and probably jeremy you can probably talk about this about uh, a little bit but responsibility around like uh people who feel like they're addicted to pornography or they can't stop or something like that but the 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 idea that um that it turns you into this like homeless like drug addicted a uh, monster uh is is so far like beyond the realm of reality that it just it's it's infuriating and that's why i call the, the book the cancer of this I, I i wrote a scathing review on um goodreads uh, because yeah it really it really messes you up but jeremy can you touch on that a little bit well it's it's just like blatantly propaganda first of all right like <laughs> that didn't happen mm. um but also uh just like the fear mongering in, in purity culture, like you're going to get pregnant, you're going to get an STD, you're going to probably die from that STD because it's not going to get treated because they're not going to tell you how to actually get treatment or anything like that. So it's like this fear around uh, like losing control or like you're going to go to a, a, the porn store and then you're going to start buying cigarettes and then you start doing drugs and then you're going to be <laughs> like, it was always oh, like this, yeah. this horrible thing. And like porn's not addictive, right? Like an orgasm, you can't get addicted to your own orgasm. It just feels great. Like your body likes it. It's wired to like it. So you're not fighting your porn addiction. You're fighting like your natural body. You're fighting a very natural system in your body. Mm. And that's why so many dudes, like I, as a male therapist, I saw mostly guys with porn addiction. So many guys were struggling because it, it, they're told it's an addiction in the 12 step model, which is also like nonsense and isn't based on good science. So like it's this 12 step model of like uh, sobriety is nothing like right. No porn bounce your eyes. If you see a woman in in a tight outfit, mm -hmm. like you're not supposed to look at her like that's the like porn people's like stance is like not just pornography, but like any lust. And so I think it's it's it, they get taught like a bad a bad definition of addiction and then like yeah. a bad definition of what sexuality can be like and when it's healthy and then like, you know, throw in some misogyny and blame the women and like you know a bunch of other unhealthy stuff on top of it and like it feels like this very uncontrollable thing because it's just so skewed like it's not based on anything it's not a realistic stance to be taking as like this is what healthy is if you're maniacal about controlling your lust like that's not mm. healthy so yeah. then they come in feeling not healthy nicole has this like amazing perspective on this all you nicole you you say that like you're you're like you see it as just like something that like blesses someone like it's like uh, you know you're sharing yourself you have an only fans you share yourself and for you it's a really positive and uh affirming thing you you say that you've come home from church to your sexuality um and i, de I definitely think that's a that's a that's a healthier way to to engage and i think that if you are going to watch pornography or masturbate or whatever there are healthy ways to do it you don't have to, you don't have to, uh, you shouldn't be lying to your spouse or, or things like that. You should have conversations. You should be engaging in these things, uh, um, like with anything, like what Dee said, like M&Ms can, can get addicted to M&Ms. You can get addicted to alcohol. Like, 
uh, we, that's, we do sober month sometimes or sober week on deep drinks because it's good to have breaks. You know, there's too much of a good thing can be a bad thing because you just enjoy it too much, I guess. But um, Dr. Ben, what were you saying? Well, I was just going to bring up the point that, that you end up uh, getting into potentially some even more ethically sticky behavior when you're so uh, opposed to, to porn. I mean, sure, there's like, you can go into problems within like the porn industry itself, but like, but let's just talk about people like on OnlyFans that are, they're doing it for themselves. They are consenting to the, the uh, content that they're making. They want to be making this. Like you're taking somebody saying that you cannot engage in this consensual activity where you are purchasing something somebody chose to make and wants you to purchase, and now you have people potentially looking into uh, like pictures and things that, that are not consensual, uh, like they're they're not viewing consensually, and they're potentially engaging in more dangerous behavior. So I, I think there's definitely like a lot of a lot worse outcomes that you get from telling people to to not engage with pornography. And it's so interesting mm. that like we try, someone wrote this in the chat earlier about like when you try to take one rule and apply it to all humans from all walks of life with who are wired also differently, it's just baffling. So for example, you know, I was taught in my evangelical upbringing that like anything sexually deviant would ruin your marriage, would ruin your life. And I find actually the more sexually deviant things to do, like threesomes, group sex, hiring an escort has actually brought me closer to the people I date because it brings me alive and I feel connected and I feel in love. It has the exact opposite effect of what I was told my entire life. But it wasn't until I gave myself permission to do the things I've been taught to fear the most that I learned that about myself. And so there's so many things we can be prevented from even knowing about ourselves because of purity culture. And that is harmful because I've unleashed whole new lev levels of pleasure, of closeness, of intimacy, because I've been willing to brave the, the fearful frontier. And it's been so healing. And that's why I do think my OnlyFans is an incredibly healing place because in my space, all of you is welcomed, your kinks and your fetishes, your fears and your hopes. Like I want your whole self to be welcomed so you can reach new levels of freedom and pleasure in your life. Mm. There's, um, and that's, that's amazingly said, uh, I wasn't going to bring this up cause I didn't have the study on hand, but I had heard of a study that, that looked at like sexual assault, um, when, uh, nations made pornography legal and those sexual assaults went down and someone, Alan Anima said, fun fact, increased porn consumption correlates with reduced sexual, uh, assault, which I, I thought was um, pretty interesting. I don't know how true that is. Don't go fact check me on that one. Go fact check, fact me on that one. But yeah, it's definitely you know there are definitely it's, it's a it's a fine line obviously and there's also another conversation to have around consent in regards to you know p uh, people being coerced into the industry and stuff horrible disgusting sex trafficking stuff but the but what you're saying nicole is that is that's why that's why i'm a huge advocate for you uh is because what you, you seem to approach it very in a very healthy way uh and i and i really appreciate that um one last clip I want to show, huge trigger warning for this one, but this is the clip I want to show. The last, the, the, this is the home swing that um, every young man's battle tries to give. It's an interview with Ted Bundy, the serial killer, and it's his last interview and they showed it. So here we go. Get ready for some absolute uh, sophistry. Ready? Listen. I'm no social scientist, and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Um, I think <laughs> yeah, did so you know did you know that the <laughs> most common uh, substance used for cellular respiration in all serial killers is oxygen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And all of those people that have used oxygen uh, 
every. Do you know when you're convicted of murder, you'll say porn. whatever the fuck you can to get off? <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. I'm sorry, but I don't want my porn statistics to come from a serial no killer. Kidding. <laughs> every person that has consumed pornography will die or has already died. So therefore, yeah. it's the so porn true. that killed them. It's it like is. what you think you will find. You know, if you, if you just, if you're looking for it, you'll find it. It's just like, yeah. what's your angle? What's your agenda? What's your propaganda mission? You're going to find a way to promote it. It's insane. Also, is it is it possible that people just watch porn, whether you're a serial killer or not, and it's more likely <laughs> yeah. that you do than you don't? Like, of course, yeah. that's the common thread. They can't, <laughs> they can't study. Bodies, you're probably into some graphic pornography as well, which is what he goes into. Oh. They can't study porn anymore, like uh, on a, at a like research institution level. Studying porn is really hard because there's no control group because you can't find enough people in the study who haven't watched porn. So like, right, it's something like 98% <laughs> of the population identifies uh, watching porn like more than three times, I think, is the cutoff. So it's like, right, there's three the times in their life. Everyone. Yep. Wow. Yeah. So like there's also studying studying porn is so hard. And that's why like the Christian propaganda stuff is so bad because they're gonna say, like, well, these people, whatever. And it's like, no, like that group doesn't exist. They're either just lying or you're making up those statistics. Mm. This is this is me needing to have studies in front of me but not having them. But I remember something that <laughs> was like it was like eighty eight percent of men have watched pornography in the last uh six months or the last mm -hmm. six or two months. Yeah. This is this is why I need to study, but women it was only like twenty or thirty percent less. It was like fifty to sixty percent of women have watched in the last six months. So it's like it's it's uh, there's definitely women uh, tend to not like it as much as men. It seems in the statistics, but um, but uh, yeah, they still seem to watch it. Or women who men. admit, I would have yeah. never admitted in a study back because even back in my pure days, I still watched it on occasion. But you, I, you could never have gotten that truth out of me, and I would have absolutely said in a, in a research study. I do not watch it. Oh, so I, wow. think, I think there's a lot of shame and secrecy, and I don't think those numbers are fully accurate. Well, and and there's a lot of um, like there's a lot of factors related to the target audience for a lot of porn. I think like the majority of porn is targeted towards a male audience, and so you oh, might yeah. not find as much that women are interested in because there's just less available that appeals to them. I have had experiences where I've tried to show uh, I'm trying to think am I crossing a line here I'll say partners <laughs> um, pornography uh, before and um, and it's like the, the stuff that I, I'm like I'm trying to find a clip that they might like but everything that I've like that I, like I've saved or whatever is like is, is very male centric focus like you're not see, you're not seeing much of the the, the whole uh, the whole scene you're just seeing very focused. <laughs> areas you know what i mean so it's like and i'm like uh and it's like and it's like this isn't doing anything for me i was like i can see why and i'm like and i'm like look and i'm like damn it nothing is like nothing is there's no i don't have a like i don't have girl porn in my uh in my repertoire you know and this um, is why i make what i make i got you women yeah. i got the couples Come on. Yeah. i got you <laughs> if awesome. you're not a book of fairy erotica i don't want you <laughs> i I enjoy like the 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 novels. So I it's, it, would that would you guys consider that porn? I think like, like reading some of the studies they or do, they do. would that be porn? Well, it depends. I, are you are yeah. you masturbating when you like read them or like think about you know like I is think it, is about it... my like my husband. <laughs> okay, so but, like, husband into the I, yeah, rock, of, like, but like cowboy it the... makes me all like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, I think that counts. You know, it's Would like that anything that enriches that your porn? sexuality. Yeah. Okay. So then, it's yeah, I guess porn. then, yeah, I've because <laughs> I, 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 I listened to like I've listened to that deep. I, I don't know if I can promote. I'm not promoting it, but I've done a trial <laughs> of deep. I think it's called Deep Sea, and it's like um, I've heard of that. They, 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 they read it to you, and not read it, but it's like acting it out to you it yeah textual around yeah that. yeah and i'll just be doing things around the house and i'll have my earbuds in and i'm like okay i need to stop <laughs> um, is it good you grab your husband it's really Come good here. and it's and yeah. it'll tell you like 
like it'll it, it's like seven minute clips and then it'll it'll actually give you like where the the, the peak point is and it's really like intense and then it's like i'll just be cleaning my kids rooms and i'll be like okay i need to turn this off because <laughs> oh, it's wow. i it's for me i'm someone who's like I, I need that build up in my mind. I, I don't know if I'm someone who's more of a visual person because um, yeah. like I'm going to be a, like, I'm not lying to you guys because I have anything to hide. I've actually never seen any visual of, of porn. Like I'm, I'm being a hundred percent. People have said I've lied online because I've said, but I have read books and I've listened mm. to that stuff, but um, I do enjoy the, like the books and the reading and the, in my brain. So I guess if that's considered porn, then yes, I have consumed it. Um, and I it's enjoy it. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's so, no, no shame. You don't have to have like looked at. Um, yeah. And, you know, and preparing and for to, yeah. To like be part and of the group, you know, pre preparing for this panel. I've, I've talked, sorry, I don't know if you can hear that thing. I've talked to my husband the other night about this. Cause I was like, should we watch it? And he's like, He's like, I don't know. I think because a lot, like, he's like, you can, but a lot of porn is like for, like you were saying, for for men, it's just like the boom, like right to it. And he's like, I don't know if you would enjoy it necessarily. So I said, well, yeah, go, I like. Go subscribe like to Nicole's OnlyFans, and you'll, <laughs> you'll get a bonus. Now I know Nicole, so I'd be like, oh, that's Nicole. <laughs> I got yeah. you. <laughs> but I. Funny. Yeah. Nicole, I was going to say, since um, we've kind of got to know each other, I've gone from seeing, because I used to follow you on Instagram and I see your images of like, oh yeah, like, you know, hot, hot girl, pretty girl, like, you know, you know, just like, I just see, like, that's the part of my brain that's it. Now I see you and I'm like, fuck yeah, Nicole. Like, I'm like, yeah, you're rocking it. Like, it's, you've become like, you've gone into the friend zone in my head where I'm like, yeah, like, I'm like, uh, I don't know, I'm like, I'm like cheering you on on this, on the sidelines. Like, you get it. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's funny how my brain has changed. It. Thank you. Yeah, while we're um, still on the uh, porn topic, just for a second, uh, for I, I've talked with trans women about kind of the the different experiences like between trans men and mm. trans women, and uh, I I cannot speak for trans women at all. So purely from my experience as a trans man, um, it's it's very interesting how many trans guys will watch like POV porn because of the fact that you it's actually more satisfying than a lot of like in-person activity because you can control what anatomy your brain sees. And so you can, mm. you can choose uh, what, what you would want your own anatomy to be like in that certain situation, how you would use it, et cetera. Um, which is very, it gives me a lot of euphoria and a lot of other guys euphoria too. Cause then, cause I will just, in real life, I will ignore that part of my body. Like I like, I like the way it feels not in those, like not in, uh, not being used by somebody else. If that makes sense. Like, uh, cause it just doesn't, it just doesn't work with, with my brain. So having mm. the ideal anatomy for what my brain would want is really helpful. And so that's where, uh, porn is really helpful for trans people. Yeah, that's, that's super that interesting you that that's so beautiful i feel like i so i recently discovered vr porn and it's like that it's pov you can pick the body um the genitals that you have and i sometimes joke i have an invisible penis and i was surprised that when i put on this headset and picked a, a body with a penis like it did something for me um mm -hmm. and it it was healing for me and it, it named something i've always felt but i've never put words to and um I love that we have more options like that. So Dr. Ben, thank mm -hmm. you for bringing that up. I, I think I love that this has become like a um, porn hour, definitely. But um, and, but the uh, Nicole, there's there's a whole there's a whole group of ex evangelical dudes who want to watch like strap on. Oh yeah. Uh, when no, I was a Christian Jeremy. counselor, oh, like, oh, yeah. am I gay? Am I straight? Like, oh yeah, that's the big one. Or like. Uh, the, the the question is like is um yeah there's there's lots of questions like that but the, the I'm I'm different to everyone I think in this in this well different to the people who've spoken on this panel yet I don't actually like to visual visualize myself in the porn I don't like to pretend I am the person engaging in the porn I like to pretend I'm in the corner of the room touching myself behind a <laughs> um, like a, a, a 
uh, like you know like i like to watch other people have sex and see what they're enjoying like i'm very i did this like kink test that was like 20 minutes like a kink test online and i like got voyeurism for like nine percent yeah i like to i like to watch other people engaging in it i don't like like in fact i think i would i think if i was ever in a group setting i would prefer to um be watching more than engaging it's it's i'm super weird like that i don't know a lot of friends who are who are like that um uh, I'll, I'll be in the center stage. Know. I'll be the exhibition. I think like, but I, that's part of the issue around like having good education around stuff like this because research is so far behind because we just like get in, try to get in a research grant at a, a public university to study something like this. So it's like the Christian groups are way ahead and putting out all this propaganda because they have their own publishing houses and they'll put it like, it doesn't have to pass peer review. Mm -hmm. So like to get good, like peer reviewed information around like what are, what's the trans community looking at? What's uh, the LGBTQ community looking at? Like, we just don't have that information. I'm working with, when I work with clients now who are in one of those uh, minority communities, it's like, well, you know, here's our best guess, but I can't tell you any research because it just doesn't exist right now. Mm. There needs to be there, there needs to be some some I think some conversations, uh, some studies and conversations around how to engage with pornography in a relationship that is like healthy because it's very easy to, uh, especially in a long term relationship, to just to um, to go to pornography as like uh, the easy you know get your fix and kind of move on, like explore your sexuality or have some fun and move on with your day and then it's really easy to uh, lose that intimacy with your partner and i think it becomes work to kind of um to to have a balance there um where you can still have fun and not everything's uh, full of drama but but uh the the information that's online is either um uh is either like it's either one extreme or the other, but the main, the, the extreme that I see a lot of the time is like porn will make you Ted Bundy. Like that's the, like porn will ruin your life. Like, so, and ruin your marriage. And, you know, so there, there needs to be, so there's definitely a balance that needs to, to come there, I think, and some conversations around like, how do you, how, like there, there are some, and there's no shame, like there are no shame even in this group of like, there may be, people might not be comfortable um, watching pornography in a relationship and that's totally okay as well. Like that might be where they're at or, or what they, that's just how they want to live their um, relationship or whatever. But um, there definitely needs to be some conversations around them. I think, I think it's uh, it's something important that hasn't been studied enough. Like you said, Jeremy, um, let's move on to um, some purity culture horror stories. Um, and I wrote, uh, wrote a little comment just, just before we move on to that about um, once you start wearing shoes, it's hard to walk down the street without them. And that's the the concept of like pornography, right? People say like, oh, well, you'll start watching pornography or you start masturbating and then you won't be able to, you'll be addicted to it and you want to do it. It's like, well, am I addicted to shoes? Am I addicted to like coffees from like the coffee shop? Like what what am I, you know, like what, what level do you start, you know? <laughs> I mean, like just, yeah. uh, I don't know. <sighs> okay uh yeah some some so some purity culture horror stories what have we got i want let, let's 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 get some uh the the, the dankest of horror stories. who's got the best horror story from when you're in purity culture oh man mine's not the best oh well, you not, go not the funniest but, but i can <laughs> i can go if everyone's hesitant to start yeah, um, yeah so interesting things like so I, of course, like when I was in college, I had met like, I tried to date people a few different times. Like I tried to date some men and it just like, I was never really interested. Um, but something that like really bugs me about it, I, and this has roots in purity culture, but it uh, happens even outside of religion but i i frequently see people like joking on the internet about like how much they hate their partner or like especially it's, it's usually women that say like oh my husband's so terrible like i don't love him like they, they'd be like joking about it but it's like very hostile and i think that's number one not very healthy to do for any partner like mm -hmm. If you have dirty laundry, like in your marriage or whatever, handle that off of Facebook. You don't need to be on Facebook trash talking your spouse. Um, but like what it what it taught me was that like as the female in the relationship, like 
you're not expected to be happy. No one cares how you actually feel. So I went into relationships with men thinking, oh, well, I don't actually really want this, but I guess this is what it's supposed to feel like. And so I stayed in relationships like that, knowing that I had no desire to be there. Um, and I ended up like in a relationship with someone who probably, if I was a heterosexual female, it would have been the perfect relationship to, for me, except for the fact that he wasn't a Christian. So like that was the, the one downside with him. But but like he was getting a master's in history, like he was great to talk to. Like we, like we were we were really good friends. Like we had a really good time. Um, the problem was like I was not at all physically compatible with him. And like I just could not I could not move from like, hey, we're just hanging out to like anything more physical, I would feel super, super awkward doing that. And it turns out it's because I was a raging homosexual. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> but like, like that whole horror story, just like being being put into these relationships that like you're not ex expected to get any satisfaction in at all. And I, I feel like that's a common experience for anyone assigned female or anyone that's read female in the church that like, and, and why we see so much trauma especially among women in the church like because they get into these relationships like even for years in these marriages that like they they might not know that it's okay to not like to, to walk away from something they have no feelings for and where it's just not healthy for them yes. um so that was that's kind of my horror story it's not funny or, or out but there really, but i no, thought it was a good important. point yeah, it can bounce off of that because like I thought of one because I was trying to think of horror stories before we hopped on. But one is like I never was given an orgasm the entire 12 years I was married to a man. Right. And that was part oh, of me wow. being ingrained as a woman. My pleasure is not a priority. And and the, and he knew I never faked it. It was a topic of conversation. It was a huge point of contention. And I'd be like, can you imagine having sex with me for a decade and never getting off? He'd be like, yeah, that would suck. And that's as far as the conversation would go. And it wasn't until after I got divorced, and this was just a few years ago, that I finally had the realization and the courage to demand pleasure, that I will not date you if you do not give me orgasms. And the mm. only way to know if someone can give me an orgasm is by having sex with them before marriage. So like everything I was taught no longer fit the life and the context I was in. And even another like horror story is like, I didn't know what consent was until five years into my marriage. I was 30 years old. When I learn from women, my, my my new girlfriend saying, "Oh, we say no to our husbands all the time," and I go, "Wait, what? That you're you can say no?" And they're they were horrified. But for five years, I never once said no because I didn't know I was allowed to say no. I had been taught it is my job as a dude, as a wife, my duty to fulfill his pleasure at any moment. And so, just like I look back at like the first three decades of my life, and so much was taken from me, and I had such little agency over my own body and my own pleasure that it almost feels like the work that I do is just a recovering and a reclamation of like my body, my pleasure. I am priority now, and that's part of what my OnlyFans is, is like, it is first and foremost for me. And then you all get to enjoy it as a byproduct. But that was born as a result of the harm from purity culture. I think to piggyback off of something that Nicole said, um, my perception in the church was always that marriage or partnership for a man was something of attraction and for women was something of calling. So for me, I dated a lot of men because I felt like together we could be a force for God, even if I wasn't necessarily attracted to that person. But then there's always the phenomenon of, you know, the pastor standing up on Sunday morning and saying, you know, and there's my wife in the front row. See how God can bless you when you're faithful to him. And she's like super hot. And in my church, you would just see not to reduce things to looks because there's more than looks. But I would just see these Norwegian models walking around with these absolute bag of stick guys. And I'm just like, it's because the women feel like it's an obligation, but the men are picking based off of looks. And they think that they are owed something. They think that they're owed an attractive mate because they're men of God. And I just thought that that was so interesting. And yeah, yeah. Totally. I relate to that. And I think, well, like that's patriarchy, first and foremost. <laughs> right, right. Like the, the Abrahamic religion, so like Islam, uh, Judaism, and Christianity all are coming from a patriarchal perspective. But like one of the big things with that lack of information and this idea around like women have a duty in the marriage 
like that's part of the reason abuse is so bad in the church because we have these these women who are taught to be ashamed of their sexuality and so then when they're abused like they've done something wrong homosexuality is this shameful thing within the church because if you're a male abused by your male priest then you're ashamed of what happened to you and you don't come forward and so like that's why like google whatever religion you grew up in google that and abuse and you're gonna find hits on it because every single religion has these abuse scandals because it's set up for abuse to happen like it's a feature not a flaw and like that's a shitty thing about religion that i think people don't like just call it out often enough like we're like oh a few bad apples like nope that's the whole system <laughs> yeah i remember right now giving a story about how to get a husband to stop abusing you and it was to get on your knees and pray in front of him <laughs> Dear God, please convict this man. And then the story even showed the husband continued to beat her. But eventually, after multiple times of praying and multiple abuses, he eventually was convicted and stopped. Like, that was the example given. This is how you stop it. Let yourself keep being abused until he somehow is convicted. It's exactly what he said. It's a feature, not a flaw. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing how this is normal and this is accepted. But... Uh like i'm the groomer because i'm trans <laughs> and gay right. like right where the problem really where the problem <laughs> sure okay keep telling yeah. yourself that yeah there's a there's let me just show everyone a um a meme um this is meme meme minute with uh on deep drinks let me just quickly share the screen meme minute on deep drinks but there's this meme this is not exactly the meme but it's like it's like this something along the lines of generation will start a revolution really your generation can't even decide if you're male or female or eat meat without tears in your eyes and able to work 40 hours a week and um, um play cod on consoles with controllers and it's like this this, this isn't the exact meme but the meme bothered me so much because it's like um because uh because like it was the the original one was something about how like true men have like disappeared or whatever and I was like, dog, you used to like come home and like beat your wife and like drink and like she never had an orgasm and she just grit her teeth through sex the whole time. And you're too much of a pussy to be able to talk about your feelings that you have to drink yourself stupid. Like that generation was fucked up in like so many ways that just aren't recognized. It's like, it's like, it's, you know, I smoke and drink and I, you know, bro, you can't, you're too much of a pussy that you can't even talk about how you're feeling. Like, mm -hmm. shut the fuck up. I, that, <laughs> that generation bothers me so much. Well, that generation oh, okay. had had major abuse issues. That generation <laughs> cheated all the time. Mm -hmm. It was just before yeah. cell phones. Yeah. So they got away with it way more often. And yeah. like, yeah, that's, yeah. That's they just pretended like upset. they didn't have problems. Like that, that's all that was. And the only feedback they wanted, uh, and, and by they, I mean like straight the white men, essentially. <laughs> uh, they, the only feedback they got was, supportive because that's all they would tolerate like imagine mm. if people felt safe to tell them like hey i don't want to be in a relationship with you but instead they were in these institutions that forced them to like be married at like 19 to some random dude in the church because he was a godly man because otherwise you'd be without a job and like unable to support yourself like if if they had the ability to say hey i actually don't want to be in this relationship like yeah the generation will look a whole lot different but that mm. wasn't tolerated back then and it's just it's just people suffered and didn't and you didn't know about it that's all it was 100 and that's yeah. why like, i remember my church the pastor somehow how like oh the divorce crisis and i'm like and it was all bad and like you guys need to make sure you stay buried and i i went up and talked to him afterwards just saying but isn't it a good thing because we're finally at a point where like a lot of women can leave and finally make it on their own because the economy is like maybe that's why there's more divorces. We have more options and it's safer. And like, they're like, oh, never considered. You know, it's like, they're just so brainwashed to think one thing, they cannot see it from another perspective and how there's probably a reason why a lot of us are leaving marriages that weren't for our good. And we finally can mm -hmm. have the, the option to make it out and not be completely destitute. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the brainwash in, not to completion on religion, because I think there are, you know, I think I, I I love my religious friends um, and everything, but um, sometimes religions have some do some really, really have some really bad ideas. Yeah. But, um, but just to, it seems to be the 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 brain rot or the the you know bizarro universe that some religions seem to operate in is just whack to me. I recently had a conversation with this guy called Masood, who's writing his own version of the Quran, and he's a Muslim, and he was trying to explain to me how the verse 
uh, Quran 4.34, which talks about husbands being able to beat their wives, would actually reduce domestic violence if it was put into law. So domestic violence reduces domestic violence. Like, I, I, I couldn't, un like, the, 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 the mental tricks that, that you do um, in regards to um, religions and beliefs and, and things like that is, is crazy, um, I think. And it's just um, it's something that I think it's good to have these conversations to get away from all of that. Um, or at least well, like bring it all out, yeah. Statistics and good research like takes all that away, right? So like apologetics, the bias, are explain Western it one way. bias, Western and bias, like, it's all a Western bias. And then you're like, oh hey, but actually, when we like let women speak up, or when we have a city that has good resources, and we have social workers, and we have shelters for women, like they're much healthier, and like that improves the well being, and like mm. so when you have good reason, like I, I being a Christian for so long, cause it took me a long time to deconvert. Like it was like, right. All those mental gymnastics. And like, I was doing therapy as a Christian and being like, okay, but like, that's not good for your relationship. So like, we have to reinterpret this verse this way for it to make sense because it needs to match the research. And it was like, it is just all these mental gymnastics to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, uh, it's very wild. Let's move on to unless anyone's got another horror story and um, um oh you do? Oh I was gonna just I I think I don't know if any of you went to well whoever's married but went to marriage conferences and got some crazy marriage event. I feel like one of my horror stories came from a marriage conference um at our church that we went to and um it always comes to mind we and I think a lot of people were really shocked by this. And I consider this a horror story because I just think it was horrible. But um, the guy that was there preaching and doing this conference, he told everyone in the, in the audience, congregation, whatever, that if they had ever in their life, one time ever masturbated, um, they were gay <laughs> because they... <laughs> what i'm dead serious because they basically had sex with themselves and <laughs> could have hit heard a pin drop and i remember um we oh, i'm, so, I'm so gay yeah. <laughs> i'm so very gay then <laughs> it's and, the logic jump for me yeah and it was the, the place was full and um we were just all like we were looking, like, I remember looking at my husband <laughs> and we were there with some friends and we were all just kind of like, what is like, what are the words coming out of his mouth? Like he was coming down on just how horrible it was to masturbate and just how awful it was. And he was just like, basically just reprimanding everyone tearing a strip off of them. And I was not someone who had really ever like I wasn't I didn't engage in that but I had obviously done it because everyone's done it and I was like what a I, I what a horrible thing to put on someone who struggle with it or just to put the shame not that there, I thought anything was is wrong with it but just to walk away from that and uh just to put I don't know it was just something that I thought but was, don't you know that the guy yeah. who said that also then like your guilt exactly guilt. I thought yeah like what are you Exactly, but just, you need Jeremy's good research and statistics to come in and help. Yeah, cool. yeah. <laughs> so, I just thought people are probably like, well, how are people leaving this tonight feeling yeah. and um, talking to their spouse? And so that was. I don't think we went back the next night after that um, yeah. because he was very much in the wrong. So, yeah, that was something that. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to just share because, yeah. Those, those church marriage retreats from like where it's like a youth pastor and his wife leading them are like, oh, full of bad like information. 20, yeah. like 23 yeah. and it's like, <laughs> they're 23 and they've got like their, their cool little skinny jeans and like, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Um, so Ben, oh, sorry, what are you saying, Emily? I was just gonna say really quick, my story is very short, but it relates <laughs> to the youth pastor thing. And I think it'll really help color this conversation. So my brother, who's given me permission to share this, when he was at our summer camp that we all went to as kids, our youth pastor taught like the sex talk. And he informed everyone that when performing sex, performing, 
<laughs> Sorry. When, <laughs> when, <laughs> when sexing your wife, when having sex with your when wife, when sexing your wife, <laughs> you are not to touch her bikini zones. And this is a full oh. ass grown man. I just want Wait, to what? put it out there that there are men who are having sex with their wives and not touching their bikini zones. Wow. Wait, so they are they just like kind of guiding themselves in like hands free? <laughs> I think one then... hand on the mattress, other hand on the mattress near the head because it's in missionary, obviously. Yeah, anything else. And then is sort of like watery. a movement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what? Like, Everything else might be debauchery, but missionary does the trick. Like the missionary is a good position, I think. Like I think missionary is cool. Uh, it gets a lot of it gets a lot of shame. It gets a lot of um. It gets everyone says it's boring. I, I think it's like it's a fun position. Like I, I think it's you know it's it's like vanilla ice cream. Vanilla it gets ice cream a bad is rap. Really good. Yeah, it does it get a bad, bad, bad rap. rap. Classic. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's a yes. classic. It's a, yeah. Um. Uh, and I ben, do. I have. Oh, Jeremy. Oh, yes. Tell us your. T- go. Can go. I? Can I do my story? Uh, yeah, do your story. So I, they kind, I have two, but they they feed off of each other in a way. So in fourth grade, uh, a girl in our school got her period, and she had my doll in her desk, and like this was the biggest mystery to us in this tiny little evangelical Lutheran grade school because none of us knew what my doll was, and what we is needed to like, uh, it's like a like a it's period an cramping for cramps. Yeah, it's oh. for it's for it just, cramps it, and like. Yeah, it can be used for any pain. Like it's it's just an anti-inflammatory. So fancy it, it's Advil. The, one of the it's one of the best ones that like for menstrual cl- cramps, but it it can be used for other things. But that's probably the probably okay. best one. So we had not had sex ed in our in our Lutheran school, right? That was frowned upon. So, but like it took over our classroom. Like we had to figure out what this was, like what was going on. Like this girl like hit puberty, obviously, and so she had like boobs, and so like that was enticing. And then like she had this medicine that nobody knew what it was. And the were girls you rummaging it through her purse, or how did I you don't know? Find the medicine? It was in her desk. Uh, okay. it was in her desk. And the girls, like, it, it, like, went through the girls first, and then the guys, the boys found out about it. And so it was this whole class mystery. The girls solved it somehow. This was before the internet was readily accessible, right? Yeah, kind no of old. Google on your phone. <laughs> right. And so then, like, the, it was bothering us boys because, like, the girls knew, but they weren't telling us. So then we had to find out. And, like, our school was forced, I think, to give us, like, a sex ed in fourth grade. And we weren't supposed to get it till eighth grade. So, like, we had this, like, terrible fourth grade sex ed. And I just remember, like, the the picture of the body they showed us was anatomically, like, incorrect. Like, it showed, like, a Ken doll. Like, no penis, no testicles. Like, it was like a Ken doll. And they took the girls into a different room, so no idea what they were taught. That happened in eighth grade, too. But, like, that was my first sex ed, was fourth grade, after this huge My Doll mystery had, like, consumed us for, like, a month. And then in eighth grade, we had our actual sex ed, and, and the wet dreams came up before in our chart. And whoever, like whatever Christian group produced this this video was so embarrassed about sex that they like didn't explain what wet dreams were. We, there was just this recurring scene in the video where like the kid like snuck his his bed sheets into the laundry. And so like this video ends <laughs> and like well, it's just the boys, right? Because the girls are in a different room. Yeah. And we're like, are we like going to start like wetting the bed? Like what happens in puberty that we have to change our sheets all the time? So it was like such a lack of information during our sex ed that we were all like concerned that like puberty meant we started wetting the bed again and none of us knew what was going on oh my god do you, do you like okay ladies do you feel that you were ripped off by i always was told that only guys got wet dreams and then when i had a dream where i basically had a wet dream but you, you, <laughs> like girls get orgasmic dreams right of and course, yeah. i was freaked out when I had that happen and I didn't know how to explain it. And I went to my mom and thankfully my mom helps me answer questions, but I was like, something happened. <laughs> and, <laughs> but you were, I was always told that only guys got that. So, mm-hmm. or like, I was never taught that the vagina gets wet. Like, or that it, too. Whenever I had fluid down there, I thought there was something wrong with me. And I was so grossed out, embarrassed by it until my mid twenties. I read a book on like your your reproductive your system. fertility, yeah, yep, to be you know because I can't use birth control. So, I had to use the you know the fertility method, and I was like, 
what? Like this fluid I've been so embarrassed about and so yeah, it's and, like, normal. Plays amazing <laughs> roles in my body. Yeah. Like, you guys are gonna would... die. Okay. What? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that sperm was in pee until college. Oh. And I was wondering why That's all these un unplanned pregnancies were happening because I was like, don't you decide to pee or not pee? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's oh that's adorable i i had a friend i had a friend um she's still a really good friend and it wasn't till she was like 16 she thought penises had hair that go that went right up to the tip like she thought it was just like a hairy like Ew. gorilla arm all the way up to the tip. <laughs> i'm yeah. really glad it's not it can look that way yeah. no, we always give a shit about it it's so funny yeah it's, uh... <laughs> um I'm trying to think. Like I've got a million uh, horror stories, but um, but I'm probably gonna uh, I keep losing my train of thought. But um, Ben, I wanted to wanted... I wanted to ask yeah. to ask you, Ben, about um, how has purity culture and like horror stories and stuff. How like how you have a very unique perspective, mm -hmm. but like how does it differ from like you know cis straight versus like queer trans? Like how how give us a bit of a a taster of like what yeah. you experience. Um, it, it's very interesting because like there's a lot of assumptions that go on in cis relationships and because people just assume like you have your role, you know what your role is, your role is related to what your body is and all that. And people don't really question it um, until you go into queer areas and, and now you have to question it because you just don't know. You don't know yourself. You don't know other people. And in order to really know if you're compatible, you have to address all that stuff right away. So we do communicate a lot more uh, about that kind of thing. But it's it's a journey to meet yourself uh, and your sexuality, like as a queer person, and especially as a trans person, because your body doesn't align up with how you think it should be. And, and so this is kind of a little bit of a horror story uh, for me as well, because I was I was in a relationship in this is actually in the beginning of med school uh, with a woman. And I was later on in that relationship, I would come out as trans, but earlier on, like I, uh, I, I thought I was just, I was a lesbian and I was in this relationship with a girl and I just didn't know why I was struggling so much. And I thought it was just purity culture baggage. I, I thought that I was like, you know, I just, can't make myself do sexual things because I feel bad. And that wasn't actually the case because uh, I ended up going to like an adult store with my partner. And what it was, was it was immense dysphoria because I walked into the store like, and I had so much dysphoria and it was the worst like that I'd ever had. And so it was very clear at that point that like I wasn't cis because it, it clicked for me that my issues with sex Number one, like I had already figured out that it was the the straight versus queer thing, but also it was that the role I was expected to play in the bedroom was not compatible with my body. Uh, or like mm. the role that I wanted was what I, I couldn't physically do. And so that was like really traumatizing for me. And so it was like having that understanding of, no, my, my gender is different. How my body should be is different than what it currently is. And then figuring out how I operate sexually in that kind of environment um, was something for me to figure out on my own. But then going back to that communication thing of, of why relationships can look so different in queer circles, because we've all done that with ourselves or are continuing to do it. So when you're meeting a new partner, um, it's okay to be more open about, hey, I, I don't know if I like this thing, but I want to try this. Or like, I don't know if I like girls, but I'd like to, to try this out and see how it feels. And it's, it's much more open because there's no rules for what your role is or what you can do. Whereas like, I think a lot of cishet relationships, like, and of course there are a lot of, of great ones out there, but I think a lot of them end up having issues because of the fact that they operate on so many assumptions and people don't address how true those assumptions were or not. And that might be me looking at, at cishet relationships from the outside. So I could be incorrect about that, but I'm curious what, what you all feel about 
that kind of thing. I love my queerness for that. Like, I feel like my queerness saved me from the heteronormative narrative where it's just like the way you've always thought and the way you've always understood your body and the way you've always understood pleasure and sexuality and relationships, like it's all out the window, figure out what works for you. And it's as equally as thrilling, equally thrilling as it is terrifying because everything's been so black and white my whole life. And when my queerness entered the picture, everything became gray. And it took me a while to find my footing in that world. But once I did, now I'm like, my queerness brings so much color and nuance and variation and options and possibilities that just weren't there when that was not part of my identity and framework. So to, for me, it's been a huge gift and a blessing. Hmm. I say all the time to couples, uh, like the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community is like eons ahead in communication around sex. Uh, just kind of like what Dr. Ben was talking about, like, because they've gone through that process themselves, they can articulate it so much better than a lot of the cishet couples I work with who are either like, even if they're not coming out of purity culture or having shame, they just haven't had a reason to think through these things. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of figuring it out on the fly. And then they're much worse at communicating about it. Like, the poly couples I work with and the couples who are doing like ENM stuff, like ethical non-monogamy, like they just, the communication is so much more open and better as just like a general rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I imagine you'd like for, you kind of forced into that position um, uh, as a member of the LGBT community, I guess, because you're not like, it's, it's, it's kind of a shame in one way, but it's also like, it's your power in another way, you know? Like, does that make sense? Like, it's a shame that we have that it has to be like that, 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 um, but it's also awesome that it, uh, that you have that as like a power, you know, it's like, it's like a benefit to the, to the whole group. I have this joke that I always say that kind of, I think exposes the, um, underlying narrative of, um, of, um, uh, like the normative, like ideas people have but it's like i always say we got a new newborn boy atlas and i always say like i'll still love him if he's straight i'll love him i'll accept him just i'll never i will never send him to straight conversion camp i'll never you know like and people people feel funny about that when i say that because um that it, it shows the it shows the um the bias uh amongst uh like the, the heteronormativity around um the conversation around um this which is yeah it's hard um for people Let's talk about sex positions. I just thought you question earlier and I'm like, seeing everyone's responses. I'm like, ah, we need to talk about Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do let's do two things. I got I got two horror stories I want to quickly tell of my own. Um, and we 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 are going a little bit over, but I'll I'll we'll try to keep this um reasonable. Everyone, I want you to post your sex positions, your favorite your favorite sex position, if you're game, uh, or your favorite sex act in the comment section, and then we'll discuss. Also, like this stream. It's the, one of the best ways you can help support this channel. We've got 39 likes, 49 viewers. 10 of you haven't liked the stream. And I know- <laughs> Come on, people. Like the one of stream, it helps. One of them's me. I'm working gods. on it. Hey, hey. <laughs> the, it helps the algorithm gods um, and it, 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 set, it boosts the um, channel a lot. And if you want to support this channel, obviously Patreon and joining and super chatting is a huge thing that, that helps. Um, I got two super super. As you post your um, as you post your favorite sex acts in the in the comments. Hopefully, if you if you be careful to what you write because it might get like instant moderated or whatever. Not my not, not by me. But so maybe change the wording a little bit. We'll understand what you mean. Uh, but I got two quick little um, horror stories for you. So in um, when I first started discovering pornography, I remember going into a um, magazine like a news agency and just opening a porn magazine and be like, oh my god titties like i love titties like or like this is amazing and i just went and i freaked out and i just ripped out the page and just chucked it in my pocket and then walked out and then it got to the point you where stole it? yeah we stole it and then i kept going back and just stealing ripping pages That's out of so these funny. magazines and um and i remember one time i showed one of my friend and he just went oh my god and shut the whole thing down his pants and walked out and i was like oh my god and like we're, so we were stealing like all these little punks stealing magazines from the store and i remember i had this image and um, it was like folded up and I, I don't know what I did, but I stuck, shoved it under my little brother's booster seat in the car, like the car seat, forgot about it. And um, we we're driving. And so I was 11 or 12, like I was, I was young. Right. Um, and maybe even, yeah, yeah, 11 or 12. Anyway, under the car seat. And one day I come home from school as I was in primary school and I come home, I'm like da, 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 da. I go into the lounge room and I just see this like unfolded 
thing on the kitchen table and I'm there with my friend and I'll just go like, oh, uh, I go, mom, I'm going to the skate park. And she goes, David, can you please come into the kitchen, please? And I was like, uh, I'm not, I'm going to go. I've got to go. I'm, you know, I'm late with a friend. And she's like, no, come in. And she came in. And she's like, so, um, so I was walking around the supermarket and my youngest brother, um, Neil, who was like, you know, three or four at the time, he was walking around showing everyone in the supermarket, this, this image. And my mom said, where did you get this from? Where did you get this image? And he's like under the car seat. And he, he was going around the shopping center showing everyone. He had like pulled it out and then unfolded it in the super shopping center and was showing everyone in the, in the supermarket. And I was like, and then um, she put two and two together, realized it must be me. And then we, we spoke about it. And then, yeah, it was, um, it was, it was funny. Um, and then skipping forward ahead to um, when I was a youth pastor, we had, used to have these anti-masturbation clubs. And I haven't told this part of the story, but essentially we'd have these men's groups and we'd all like message each other when we're horny. And it was, it was not like no porn. It was no masturbation. So it was like, you call someone and you'll, or you text someone, you're like, pray. And when they get a text, pray, it means you're horny and you need them to pray because you're being influenced by the devil or something to make you horny. Yep. So they need to go pray. And so, so many times like you'd, they'd go, they'd go away and pray. And it's so funny because like at the start of the week, no one would be sending messages at the end of the week. Everyone's like, pray, 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 pray. Like everyone's like leaving to go pray all the time because everyone's just like, they haven't like masturbated in like a week. And then they come to church on a Sunday and they see like Martha with like, you know, like the librarian church with like half a centimeter of cleavage. And they're like, Oh, I've got to, I can't control myself. And then she feels like she's got to cover up and it's like, a self-perpetuating oh like thing so it's this like they told but, but, martha no 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 but you, just, you know like you could tell like the guys what you can just see that the like it's a self-perpetuating thing where girls are feeling like they're making guys stumble guys are just like saying don't masturbate you're not allowed to masturbate and then um they get really horny and then you, you know they're beginning getting all like creepy around do and girls and they're like i'm gonna cover up more i'm just feeling like he's like checking me out or whatever it's just like the self-perpetuating thing like a uh, i had a friend um uh, a friend i won't mention her name uh i'll call her tia and Tia was like on the beach and um, just in a bikini. And then she got a message from someone saying, hey, just so you know, you made me stumble. Um, it wasn't cool what you're wearing um, from one of the guys. Um, so she's like, oh, OK, I'm sorry. And and uh, yeah, I essentially I masturbated because of you. And it's like, oh, OK, I'm sorry about that. Um, um, compliment. <laughs> it's a compliment, but it's also weird. it's super weird. Like it's super I mean, weird. I feel I, I feel like that pure... people will like masturbate it, whoever. But it's like it's weird when it's not consensual. Them. Number one, yeah, and like don't tell them that you like. Yeah, were, it's a little doing sexual assault them without their consent. Don't, like <laughs> don't shame yeah. them and for it either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I actually but, have. A, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that I, I remember I did like something like for me it was a record. It was like ten days or eleven days without masturbating or something, and it's um you know right in my horny young adult years. And I remember I had to not go to a ministry meeting because I worked at the checkouts at Woolworths, and I guess there was a lot of hot people that came through that day or something. But something ha I, I essentially got blue balls to the point where I couldn't walk. <sighs> Like I was in so much pain and I had, to, I called up and I was like, look, I'm feeling sick. I can't come in. And I, and I went home because I essentially like, I, I was in, I was in actually excruciating pain because I, I guess was horny and then couldn't masturbate. So I went home and masturbated and I felt a lot better, but like, it was, oh it was like a physical, <laughs> it was a physical thing. Um, yeah. It was, Is uh, that real? It, Cause I feel like people just no. say that to make you people feel say bad. that I'm telling you it's real. In fact, so many times, so many times if if amy and i have like planned as like a sexy night and we're like doing a date beforehand i'm like fuck like i've been thinking about it all day and i'm like we need to like get to like i'm i'm in pain now <laughs> to the point i've i've once this one time sometimes it'll even last longer i guess i'm just a really excitable dude but like and ben ben maybe you can help me out here man I've, I've gone to the doctor and they're like what are you talking about dude? but anyway but i i, I go i you know I, i've like I've, I've finished the the action and felt, still felt the pain, felt sick, and then like been dry reaching outside from the pain because like it was so painful because oh I just, gosh. yeah. So yeah, it's been, it's been real. Like <laughs> it doesn't happen as much anymore. I'm not so, this is when we first got married, but yeah, I, yeah. So, hey. <laughs> hey, <laughs> it's real to <laughs> Yeah, be careful. <laughs> Do I hurt <laughs> Blow up, my, my balls just blow up. Like, yeah, but oh it, it was, goodness. it was definitely weird. Yeah. Um, cool. So everyone's sexual positions. Okay. Let's read some yeah. comments. <laughs> ah. 
So I love titties, Dave McDonald. Thank you. <laughs> Missionary is my favorite. Feet to the ceiling. Awesome, Eddie. Uh, Megan says hashtag same. Um, have we missed any? I'm just going up. Yeah, there. Megan um, said pegging up there earlier. Oh, yep. Yeah, pegging. Okay. Does can anyone explain? Someone may not know what may not know what pegging is. Someone explain what pegging is. Just so, I want to see some. Nicole, I think you should take the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I just got pegged for the first time last weekend. So I oh! on cloud nine from it. <laughs> but um, and I love to peg. I just had never been pegged. So it's typically where you put a strap on, you wear like a harness or an underwear that allows that, that can hold a dildo, and then you can use it to thrust into different holes. Um, yeah. so queer people, trans people and, and men and women, like every gender can use them and you can use it and even have them for different body parts. Like you can like, they have them for like your knees or like different things to make them accessible for all bodies. Um, but it's just mm. another way to, uh, penetrate. And I love pegging. I think it's so hot. And then I loved being peg. Pegged. Is it, is it pegging? Is it specifically to a, a guy or is it pegging can because i thought it was a strap on sex but i thought pegging was specifically to guys well she like just said she pegged. got pegged for the first time last weekend so yeah it, so it must not i don't know i'm not yeah i'm not the expert here so tell us more anyone... <laughs> so my experience last weekend was where a woman put on um a strap on and then pegged me in my vagina um and then i've pegged a guy in his ass and i like that so yeah, is it? Um, is any of this on your on your? I will be shouting at everyone's stuff in a sec. But is, is this on your OnlyFans or is this just in your private life? Uh, private, but I do have photos of me with my strap on on because I think it's so hot. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> awesome. my pink penis. It's amazing. <laughs> awesome. Uh, actually, funny enough, um, my little brother got uh, me a um, my little brother Leo got me a strap. Got Amy and I a strap on. Like, so we're opening our engagement presents with everyone. Yeah. Everyone's getting like a nice vase and stuff. Open up a box. It's like a strap on vibrating dildo, um, a gag ball with drool holes and like some whips and chains. And I was just like in front of everyone. And I'm just like, uh, uh, uh. like this is a really funny, this is a really expensive joke, but he, he did it. Yeah. So it was, it was funny. Uh, and funny, funny story. Oh. When we were moving house, we had our, we had our grandparents, um, going to open up the box of all those like crazy stuff that we have that we've that most of them we've never used and like butt plugs and all this stuff. Open up and went about to open it up our grandparents and we're like ah and some and one of the sisters <laughs> knew what was in the box and grabbed it. It's like oh, it's okay, I know where to put it and we're lucky they didn't open it anyway. Posse, I like <laughs> toys. <laughs> uh, I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie Ann, a doggy style with my face in the wall. Oh my God. <laughs> Boris, prone bone. That's cool. Caitlin, I like being little spoon. Um, being pegged while a guy rides on top. That's oh cool. Um, um, receiving and I like giving oral. Yes. Titty thief. I don't know if that's a, a move. That's about your that's story. Just... Oh, my story. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's a new position. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think we did that one. That sounds really gay, David. I don't know. What that <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anti-masturbation club. It isn't masturbation if your friend rubs your penis for you. Um, what's, have we got? I'm just trying to look for. Yeah, there was a bunch here. earlier, but I can't find them now. It's uh, right there. Um. Shame in blushes being. I think we're at the we at some yas queens and some stuff like that. So I think we're done. Prostate <laughs> orgasm is amazing. Um, yas, yas queen <laughs> slay. <laughs> awesome. I, if I missed any any, I apologize. But thank you for being brave and sharing. That's uh, it's awesome. Let's get rid of shame. It's good to um, it's good to be able to express uh, who you are. So let's move into, uh, we are, we're going up to time, but let's move on to some advice. Does anyone have any advice for people who maybe um, uh, have like, who want to have like a sexual, uh, a, a healthy sexual, healthy sexuality, who want to be able to express themselves, but not feel like they're going to end up like Ted Bundy? Like what advice <laughs> would you give? God. And gonna... everyone will have some question and answers after this. So make sure you, you ask some questions. I have a couple of thoughts. So I think one of the biggest things I tell like my clients that I work with or people who come into my orbit for the first time is especially for women. And I think queer people is like, you can trust yourself. 
I've been told my whole life, I can't trust my body. I can't trust my intuition. I can't trust my gut. It will all lead me astray. And so I always listened to my pastors, my parents or my husband and was so afraid when I finally went on this journey to live life on my terms. I was so afraid that I was going to ruin myself, become the female version of Ted Bundy. And yet it was, <laughs> it was me trusting myself that led to my freedom and my healing and my liberation. And then my, once you start learning to trust yourself, um, I tell my clients to, you know, someone arbitrarily gave us lines we're not supposed to cross without knowing how we're wired, our desires, our identity, our pleasure. So I tell them the only way we can find our line is crossing the ones placed for us. So if you feel led in a direction to a line that you've been told to stay away from because it'll ruin you, I encourage them to consider crossing it because only after crossing it, you'll know if that is a line for you or not. And you'll often find that line, maybe it is, now you know. At least you now know, and it wasn't someone else's rule for you. Or if you cross and it's not your line, cool, where is your line? And it just opens mm -hmm. up the whole world of exploration and can lead to a whole lot of pleasure. So I agree with that. Nicole. Just... Sorry, go, go, Emily. I was just going to say, I what Nicole said resonates with me so deeply. I think even if you're not going as far as maybe things that we've talked about here, you're told your whole life when you grow up in purity culture that the Bible is the source of source of truth that you have to refer to when defining your own relationships. And it turns out that you are that source of truth. And so I would just say that your, in, your intuition is so much stronger than you would think and explore adventure to the point where you're comfortable. And I hope that you can get rid of that shame because shame is the most limiting emotion um, in the, in the human emotion dictionary <laughs> yeah mine's mm. along those same lines of there's no script the script is a lie just ignore it uh it's it's a blank page and you get to decide what goes on that page and if you've got something you you want to try like find a, a consenting partner that will do that with you or do it with yourself or whatever as long as you're engaging with uh in consensual activity with somebody or multiple people who are consenting adults, then do whatever, do what, I mean, definitely like be safe, like use protection, uh, like make sure that you're, you're risking what you're willing to risk. Cause yeah, some people are okay with risking, uh, some more unsafe activity, but other people, uh, are not willing to risk that. Know what you're willing to risk, What where your lines are. Again, like you can, uh, like Nicole was saying, you can start crossing some of those. Don't let other people set your lines for you. Um, but definitely understand kind of like what safety measures you want to use. And as long as you're, you know, being consensual with people who can consent, then Enjoy the script it. is yours. <laughs> and if you are, if you are sexually active, get tested. And get tested Absolutely. really. I think there's a lot of shame and stigma around getting tested, but like get tested. It's good to know for your own health. It's good to know for your partners or people you're hooking up with. Like testing regularly is a great idea. That's great. There's, I, <clears throat> I just uncovered a un unconscious bias that I had when you were talking, Nicole. You said, you know, try everything. It does, and, you know, and if it's not your thing, you can kind of like, you know, well, I don't want to do that anymore. I realized that I had this like perspective that it's like once you try something, you've like crossed this line. Like you've got, you've like now done, the, the, you've done the thing, right? Where that's not necessarily how like humans work. Like that's, that's the, that's the narrative kind of spoken about in like, in like purity culture, which is like you've, you've now crossed this line. You've now done this, this thing where it's like if you want to engage in something and it's consensual, both parties are consenting and um, you, you want to try it out. If it was, if it's a horrible experience, just don't do it again you don't that's it you don't have to it doesn't have to ruin your life like if you don't want to do it that's that's cool i never thought about uh sexual acts in that way that you could just kind of try something and decide whether or not you liked it or not to me it was always like um yeah it's so weird it I, was I, just, I just uncover this bias yeah it's like it's like if you've like let's say if i was like i want to sleep with a man like i want to try it or something like and and um and i did one time it would be like it's like I would have thought to myself, like now I'm gay, or now I've now I've done something that's like gay or something like that's like a bias that I have, but it's like not that's not a. I just or, I don't know. Or you were, you told, my mind yeah. were you told like it's a line that you can't ever cross back again? Like that's how it yeah, would have yeah. been told. Yeah. So yeah, you've yeah yeah. That's it's so, so like I just had sex with like 
on a bed with nine people last weekend and it was amazing. And I'm like, I don't know if I would do that again. Like, like I'm glad I had that experience. And I'm like, I don't know if that's my thing. Like, I feel like, cool. it, I feel like it's a lot. I feel like there's a lot going on there. There's is, a is lot. That, it's a little too that, much for me. It was that just, was that for your OnlyFans or just like you're having a bomb ass time? It's my research. Oh, so okay. go out, for research purposes. <laughs> yes, I go research, go find what I like, what I don't like. And then I bring it back and I do um, monthly live streams in my OnlyFans where we have sex, sex ads and I update them on my latest sex page, what I like, what I don't like, what I recommend. Here's what I don't like. And, and I'm researching for me and my people. And then I get amazing experiences out of it and meet amazing people. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen says research. research. <laughs> so um, I have a is... question. Sorry, I have a question for you, Nicole. Yeah. So, like, do you find these people? Do you say, like, I need to find this out for research? Who wants to join me? How, how do you go about this? Research? I go to different sex clubs and sex parties, okay. and they're just... also different. Um, okay. This was the first time I went to an all girls sex party, and okay. before I knew it, I was in the middle of nine bodies, and I was like, holy crap, what is my life right now? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <clears throat> There's, um, there is, uh, so this is a good opportunity to shout out everyone's links. So the first link we actually have is, Nicole, you have an OnlyFans that people can go check out. You're a kick-ass life coach. Can you tell us a little bit about your OnlyFans? Yeah, so I personally <clears throat> love my OnlyFans. Like, um, I started it three and a half years ago as a place to just practice taking up space and reclaiming my body and my sexuality as good because I was taught my whole life that my body and sexuality is bad and evil and getting used to having a place where that was welcomed and appreciated and it blew up and now um, I'm one of OnlyFans top creators and the reason I love it is it's so all-encompassing right like where most of my fans when we do one-on-one -on -one zoom calls which is for sexy time they're usually asking me, how can I make more money, Nicole? How can I better pleasure my partner? How do I walk away from my religion but stay connected to my family? Like we go deep and then I make, of course, super explicit erotic content. So you get like everything fulfilled. You get the human connection. You get the deep conversation. You get the erotic experiences and content. And like there's just no other place. Like traditional uh, porn sites don't have that. You just get content and go. But here's like we talk about your relationship, your kids, your well-being. And then my personal favorite kink is couples who subscribe. Um, it is my favorite thing when couples use my content to get off and get closer. And I'm like, please tell me more. Please save my world. I love couples. Um, and I have a lot of women who subscribe as well. It's a really beautiful space. And David, I think for your fans to even know, like, it's something you can subscribe to. And if you guys find that's not your thing, you can unsubscribe. And you're, there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with it. I think people have this fear of if I subscribe to something like OnlyFans, then there's no going back. Nope, you subscribe. Mm -hmm. If it's not your thing, now you know. If it is your thing, awesome. But it's a really, really special place. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned you mentioned too for you. You started taking like and this is in your episode of Deep Brings, but you started taking nude photos for you, and then you were like, yeah. "I wonder if I should post these anywhere." And that's where it kind of like kind of started. Five because... years of naked photos of myself because I think they're hot. And when I yeah. learned that OnlyFans existed, I was like, I'm posting these for me because I want to open up a whole social media page where it's just me feeling hot. And you get to enjoy it as a byproduct. Like, you're welcome. And then now, it's, yeah. of course, it's blossomed a full-blown community and business. And it, it is, I'm in there every day. It is such an incredible space. Yeah. But yeah it's now you're fucking rich. <laughs> <laughs> you're so cute, Nicole. Yeah. Uh, so, apostasy, let's talk about oh, your there's channel. nothing here oh, right now. Why? No, Why there's nothing. It? Because I'm just starting it. Um, so, I was on the line earlier this week. So right now I'm mostly on um, Skeptic Haven every Wednesday. And then I have an Instagram, which I'm, that's where I'm most active. But I was just on the line with Jimmy Snow on Tuesday. It was wonderful. And he's actually sending me a camera and a microphone to get my podcast started with my mom. So there will be content <laughs> on my YouTube. You can show it. There's nothing at the moment. But um <laughs> He was there will amazing. be there will be because we have I just shared something about skeptic haven but um we are going to get that started and he has already sent me uh the camera and microphones for us to get our sh our channel up and going and it should be here next week so um stay tuned for that because that's something that we've been talking about for a long time and he actually just saw the yeah there's us he's so great um he saw the little blurb that i had like a stay tuned that i've had for months and he's like hey you got to get this started so i'm gonna help you and that will be coming so 
Yeah, yeah, it's so it's so cool. And you, so Jimmy Snow is coming on Deep Drinks, and you yeah. took time off work to make sure you're there in the audience. That's so... I did not want to miss that because, um, yeah, I'm just I I think Jimmy's great, and so I didn't want to miss the the episode. He's a great so. guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, he was a it's funny. He was a Mormon, and he what what did he say? He said something like, um, he realized masturbation wasn't hurting anybody, <laughs> and uh and he's autistic and that's why he's not a mormon anymore <laughs> that's like okay. that's the reason he's like i have a dick and i'm autistic now i'm not mormon that's all I think he said. so um so yeah. he's a really cool guy uh, he's, he's he's great and i'm i'm really glad that he and i have become friends in the last little while so yeah <laughs> awesome yeah. dr ben you're no longer student dr ben your family no dr. longer ben. student dr ben yeah so this is my youtube channel um <clears throat> I have some lecture style videos on there, but I don't have a whole lot of time. So uh, it's mostly live shows on Saturdays now called Medical Myths. And I pick some, you guessed it, a myth <laughs> that's medically adjacent and I tear it to shreds. Um, and it can get kind of intense depending on if there's a guest on, I don't do as much lecture in it. But if it's just me, you get a lot of uh, more lecture content in it. Um, we get through a lot of studies. This one was about artificial ingredients and why the fear mongering is problematic. And we, we looked at studies um, about certain <laughs> dyes and why they may or may not be a problem. It gets very sciencey. Um, I love it. I don't know if you want to pull ben. up. Actual yeah, Dr. Ben is your name. <laughs> oh yeah. That's what I, I put for that show. Cause that's my first medical myths uh, with, with the new name. Uh, you can also find me on talk heathen. And if you want to go to the, um, the transatlantic Colin show on the line. So people know, cause oh, that's yeah. kind of the biggest that one that we got to show, show here. Uh, I'm a, one of the main hosts on the transatlantic Colin show, which is as we're talking about Jimmy snow, Jimmy's yeah. my boss. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so we do a call in show every Thursday at 2 PM central time. Uh, it's Katie Montgomery, Arden Hart and me, and we take questions and debates about trans issues. So if, you want to ask something, uh, but don't feel confident enough to, to ask a trans friend or you don't have a trans friend to ask, or it just might be mildly offensive to ask, uh, you can call us and ask us your weird questions. Or if you don't think trans people should have rights, you can also tell us why you don't think trans people should have rights. And we will probably yell at you, but, we'll, <laughs> but we're here for those conversations. And for anyone that doesn't want to call in, but wants to listen, uh, you can, we, we have a pretty good community over there, too, and you can be in the side chat and, and listen to um, how we engage with these people who might be transphobic. Or we also actually had on this past week, uh, Josie and I had two back to back callers at the end of the show who were parents uh, with trans children uh, in in various situations that wanted to know the best way to help their kids. And so we do take those calls as well. And if so if you need advice on how to um, support your kid or support someone else in your family, uh, you can get some good tips there. So it's, it's great because it gets rid of all the nonsense, all like the, all the like Ben Shapiro talking points and all the drama that goes on with like the online discourse around, uh, transgender identity. And you just talk to two trans people and they can, and you guys are just like fantastic. Yeah. I love that show. Love you guys. What you do there. Really good stuff. Uh, so Jeremy, uh, wait, actually, Emily, Emily, let's talk about yours. So yes. did you put in the Trevor project? Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm sure you guys can relate, but uh, my time in Christianity, I just did so much damage to the queer community that I will spend my life trying to make up for it. And if you're in that boat as well and compelled to support LGBTQ plus youth, the Trevor Project is a wonderful and effective organization. And um, I hope that you will decide to partner with them. Awesome. So I, I like that you put you you put this in your um, as your main link that you wanted to share. Are you doing anything um, like that's really honorable for you to do? Is, are you doing anything that where people can reach you out to? I know that you're not doing your um, your uh podcast much anymore or you're like transitioning out of that space you're still going to do a little bit of it or what's happening with your online world not it's kind of up in the air i'm phasing out i feel that i've said everything that i needed to say and i'm excited for new people to step into the space so right now i'm just going to be supporting cool cool 
Well, um, was I the last guest that's on has been on that show? What'd you say? Was I the last guest on that show that's still up there? No, I, I have um, one more with Reverend Carla that I'm editing that I'll be releasing. Um, she's uh, wonderful awesome. on TikTok. So that's going to be really good. And that'll be my last one. Cool. You can check that out with Feral Pastors uh, podcast. Feral pa- uh, oh, my gosh. Feral Ministry Feral podcast. Feral Pastor's Wife. Yeah, Feral Ministry Feral podcast. Wife, yeah. Check that out. <laughs> Thanks, but David. It's really awesome that you did Trevor <laughs> Project. Sorry. <laughs> but, yeah, my episode's amazing. Go watch that. Uh, <laughs> it but, is really uh, good. It's one of my favorites. Is. You should go with them. <laughs> And uh, Jeremy, so you have your own uh, wellnesswithjer.com. Yeah, that's me. Uh, that's kind of just like the homepage for all my stuff. So I blog pretty regularly on whatever is in my mind. So a couple weeks ago, I wrote a blog on like the importance of comprehensive sex ed. So kind of like some stuff that's up in uh, pop culture, some stuff that's... Uh, I don't know, whatever pops in my head, I blog. I also have a YouTube channel at Wellness with Jer. I have an uh, Instagram account that I'm pretty active on at Wellness with Jer. My YouTube account's tiny, you uh, tiny. So if anyone wants to take pity on a small <laughs> channel, I talk about like mental health and comic books and mental health and movies and shows. I just don't I did not know you had a YouTube. On... I did not yeah, know you had a right. YouTube. Yeah, that's all right. I didn't. I didn't send the link. Yeah, I review songs and say why it's terrible relationship advice. Um, okay, so, you got you got seventeen to subscribe. Yeah, I love that. Um, let's let's see we can, let's see we can go boost team. people. <laughs> go, I'll, I'll post uh, a link in the uh, chat. But yeah, all my stuff's on my website first. So I'll be kicking off a new podcast soon where I interview other therapists about their mental health. So like all that stuff, I just my website has all my links and all my stuff. So wellnesswithjared.com. Awesome, 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 awesome. And you you reach out actually because you were doing some sort of like a men's was sort of men's. Oh yeah, culture. that that link is also on my website. Uh, we're in a wait list right now. Um, I was doing I set up another therapist and I. Uh, we're both male, so we're doing a, a support group, a coaching group for guys who are coming out of purity culture, because purity mm-hmm. culture is bad for men too. Even though it's set up for them to to be beneficial, but it harms them a lot too. Um, and there's a lot of great support groups out there for females. Um, and women and a lot of uh, women identifying, female identifying people are doing support groups. And so we felt like we didn't need two straight white dudes to come in and, and do that. So we're doing a group uh, for men coming out of purity culture. Uh, there's on the religious trauma tab on my website. There's a, a sign up at the bottom. Uh, so we're in a wait list for a summer group for that. So, yeah, healing sexual shame. Um, but I was just going to say, too, awesome. like there's a lot of great stuff. Trevor Project was on my list. I crossed it off. Recoveringfromreligion.org uh, is a great resource for people who are coming out. Daretodoubt.org is a great resource for people who are like struggling with some of this stuff. Just like these are these are sites that have a ton of resources to find. And then like seculartherapy.org, I always give a shout out. Like if you're coming out of religion, if you're struggling with shame, if you're struggling with purity culture, like go to therapy. Like find a support group is wonderful, but like go see someone who's trained in it. Reclamation Collective is another one that has therapists who are trained specifically in religious trauma. Mm -hmm. So like if you're struggling, like there are people who are who are who want to be helpful. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. find the help that you need. Yeah. Uh, I apologize, everyone. There's a bit, but a couple of bots in the chat. Um, so thank you, Nitty um, and Apostasy, for getting on top of that. Um, <laughs> we do need more mods. If you want to be a mod, reach out to me on Twitter or something. Um, uh, if I if I can trust you, I'll make you a mod. Uh, so guys, thank you so much for coming on. We're going to answer a few questions. If anyone has any questions, drop them in the chat now. Um, so this one is for Dr. Ben. When by Aunt Joe? When are you doing the poop show? I don't know. What I, yeah, I, I don't know. I know I've promised multiple people that I'm going to do medical myths about enemas uh, and poop. So because apparently coffee enemas are back. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> are they good? So I'm going to have to do like... that. <laughs> Wait, so actually, this is a good this is a good um, this is a good for purity culture, right? Because a lot of people before sometimes not all the time, you don't have to. No shame. But so, a lot of people will do enemas and stuff before engaging in like anal play and anal sex mm-hmm. because they don't want to get poop everywhere. Um, is it one? Well, I guess you could talk a little bit about that, but but maybe on your medical myth show or something. But should people do coffee enemas? Like, is that no, you should not do coffee enemas. No. <laughs> okay. Well, there's the thing you're essentially butt chugging coffee at that point, and it will <laughs> be more potent because you're bypassing the liver. Uh, through absorption, because when 
when you drink something or eat something, uh, oftentimes it's the molecules are, are absorbed in your intestine and then go straight to the liver. It gets some of it gets metabolized right away. So you're not dealing with the full dose of the of the compound. Whereas if it goes up your butt, the circulation doesn't go through the liver first. So you're getting the full amount of compound. So that's why butt chugging gets you uh, drunk faster and why it can be more dangerous. So that's the same thing with coffee. Don't don't do a coffee enema. It's probably not great. We should do a, a butt stuff special on deep drinks where we just talk about <laughs> Nicole will be there. Can Nicole, can Nicole join us? We'll yeah. Three of us. Let's do the butt, the butt episode. I was, I was going to say before too with like advice like if you're coming out of purity culture you're missing information like get mm -hmm. educated because like the number of dudes i've worked with who have like hurt themselves because they put something way too big up their butt because they were like <laughs> unprepared or didn't know about lube or like we're sharing like uh butt toys without like sanitizing them like people who oh, are getting right. like doing things that are like sexually risky for STIs because they don't know what protection looks like. They don't know how to protect themselves. Like Nicole said, get tested. Like if you grew up in purity culture, like aggressive fundamentalist purity culture, like you don't know what you're doing. And like, you're going to either like non-consensually harm someone else. You're going to harm yourself. Like, and this isn't like fear mongering. This is like, go get educated. Like, um, what did I write down? Sexplanations is a really great YouTube site. It's from a, a sex therapist. Just like, here's what a dildo is. Here's how condoms work. Like, if you missed sex ed or you got the Christian version of sex ed, you need to, like, re-educate yourself because you're just missing things and, and not knowing what consent is or not knowing what safety is. Like, those are problematic things to not have information on. That's that's actually, talking about butt stuff, that's actually something that I, um, I, I learned was I used to always think, I was always taught that anal sex was like a almost a predatory act it was like an act for one person to feel pleasure and the other person to just deal with it where i've since learned and since experienced that it can be extremely pleasurable for both parties um not just like anal sex but anal play um like anal analingus everything to do butt stuff can be really fun for everyone um it just it, yeah it just the, there is some obviously the get educated before you don't just jump in um uh to that um those rough oceans without a lifeboat. Make sure you have, uh, make sure you use lube and, and, and do, do it carefully, you know, because, um, yeah, otherwise it can have, be a, it can be a hard time. Um, we've got some super chats. Eddie Dean, I've waited all week for this stream, was uh, not disappointed. I had a blast. All six of you are amazing, especially Dr. Ben. Love you guys. <laughs> Thanks so much for the I love being chat. the favorite. <laughs> yeah, I'm rarely the favorite, so this is new for me. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you for boosting no. my ego more than it needed to today. I appreciate it. No, what well, we need. You're hey, so loved, uh, Dr. Ben. <laughs> yeah, so loved. And I mean, like, it's just all up. Like, I was saying this morning, you have like a glow about you. Um, Aww. And I think it's probably because, you know, you just had your top surgery. You're just like, you've got, you're going through the, you're going through, you know, the, the, um, the, the feelings associated with all of that and stuff. But I just feel like just when you're past all that, you're just going to be like, um, I, I said, when you come to Australia, we'll have you, um, I'll bring you down to Noosa beach. Uh, if you ever come to Australia and we'll yeah. have you fight, have people fighting off, uh, you'll be shirtless and run around and like, uh, you're fighting, <laughs> yeah. fighting off dudes and chicks with sticks. Like, yeah. Um, cool. Um, Nitty said, purity, smoothery. <laughs> Let's talk about dirty. dirty. All night long. <laughs> dirty. All right, <laughs> Nitty. That's <laughs> so good. Uh, and he said, Oh, here we go. If you could try, if you could try anything that was taboo in your purity, in your purity world that you haven't yet, what would it be? What an interesting question. I don't know if anyone's keen to, to answer this, but is there oh, something? I'm going to a I... furry rave next month, so I think that says all it oh, needs to. You're it. going to a furry rave? As an observer, I was invited, and the tickets were cheaper than I thought. I was like, why not? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, oh, man, I want to hear. I hope you make some TikToks about that. I'll report back. <laughs> Research. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if yeah, I could try it... anything that was on the the naughty list for for uh, purity culture, it would just be uh, 
just me as I am now. That's oh. I'm everything against. Aye. I'm everything against what I uh, oh. thought was okay. Uh, so that's so good. My family's so disappointed. And well, we're fine. not. <laughs> <laughs> we're not. We're not. <laughs> we're not. I, I know it's. Uh, it can be hard. Hey. What about anyone else? Is anyone brave trying. enough? It's fine. <laughs> Mine's like the opposite. Mine's like. I like even nervous to say this word, but I have a fantasy of a gangbang. So that's oh, okay. my thing that I like. And I, there's certain things I talk about in my OnlyFans. I'm always trying to discern what fantasies want to stay fantasies and never get fulfilled. It's just fun to imagine. And then what fantasies I actually want to fulfill. The gangbang hmm. leans more towards the first. I'm like, I think it's just something I, I like to think about. But sometimes I wonder if I might try it someday. Yeah, I've got lots of things that are like in the realm of like, I don't know if I right. would like, like I can, but like there's a lot of like, there's a lot of stuff in my head that I'm like, I don't know if I'd want to do this, but I can see why it'd be fun. Like just, um, just going wild, like Vegas, you know, typical Vegas, mm -hmm. like drugs and party and stuff. <laughs> but, but uh, I don't know, you know, that's not uh, in alignment with who I kind of want to be at the moment, I guess, with, as, a, as a new father and stuff. So, and, and happily married. So, so it's like, um, yeah, so it's like there's fantasies, but then it's like, I don't know if I would go do um, cocaine with strippers at Vegas at the moment in my life, but I can see why it'd be fun. It's a good combo. But yes, yeah, so <laughs> just do it whenever. <laughs> get, get educated before you do drugs, too. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah, do, I do drugs that. safely. I'm, do do I drugs, but do I them safely. I don't advocate for drugs. I've never actually done, uh, I've only ever done, let's smoke some weed and a bit of LSD, but. Yeah, I don't, reduction, I don't advocate for drugs. Reduction of harm is is the term we want to use around things like that. You, you yeah, can do whatever reduction. you want. Let's reduce the harm. Reduction of harm. Actually, and I should mention this, Jeremy, um, we're going to have you on Deep Drinks. Um, you're the only one who hasn't got your own episode on Deep Drinks yet because you, uh, and something that we didn't really cover, but you were a therapist and then you kind of realized that you were, that, that what you were being asked to kind of do was that, odds with the literature right can you just quickly touch on that yeah i don't know how often i talked about in therapy that wives submit to your husband verse and i was like yeah but like that's not what it actually means in terms of a healthy relationship so this is how we have to to rework that yeah so i was um uh, i went to a big research institution so like how i learned how to do therapy and how i learned like psychology was through research and why research is so important and why it's so good and then I got offered a job <laughs> uh, while I was still in grad school. And that was, um, I don't know, right after like the terrible uh, market crash. I graduated from college in 2009. So I was like kind of having that opportunity to fall on my lap. I was like, well, I don't want to go be a Christian counselor, but also I don't really want to do a job hunt. So I ended up being a Christian counselor. I worked there for like eight or nine years. Um, but I just think I kept getting more and more liberal and progressive. My deconstruction, I like to say, took me about like 20 years too long. Um, but so, yeah, I was like the things that I think other Christian therapists were saying, it's not what I was saying. Like I was pro kink. I was pro, um, like I was very pro sex. I was pro sex worker. I was pro LGBTQ community. I worked with like so many clients who were like, how do I come out to my very conservative family? Um, and trying to like make that a safe space for them. So I was, I worked with plenty of couples who I would throw shade at missionary. Cause I would say like missionary Wednesdays once a month, because you have to is like, not the way to do sex. There's so much more. Um, but like, yeah, I was saying stuff like, hey, like the Bible has a sex book. Like God wants you to have sex. And so like I was so like liberal and like I was taking the research and making it fit what the Bible was saying, not necessarily doing it. How I think a lot of other Christian counselors are doing it is taking the Bible and ignoring the research. Uh, so I was doing a lot of mental gymnastics on my part, I think, to benefit my clients. But yeah, I had to get out at some point of that setting. I I, uh, I love that you said uh, what is it missionary Wednesdays or whatever. I um I always say the other night Amy was um I bought Amy a bottle of mum uh, uh, of uh, champagne home and I was like you know what you just have a night to yourself whatever and she's like drinking it and she's like having a great time and um and she's like I'm gonna get another glass I'm like you've got to it's anal Thursdays and like I always do that to show, like and she just goes, ah, ah, so your like, days of the week conflict with my days of the week so that's the problem because my my cult has butt fuck Tuesday. 
So, <laughs> but I guess we can also have anal Thursday. I guess I guess we can combine these and have multiple days. Well, the time zones, maybe you know, like yeah, it's the Australian version of Buttfuck Tuesday. I see how. It is. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, just going to quickly wrap up um, now, guys, because we are at two and a half hours. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. In a couple of days, we have. Um, I'm chatting with a Pentecostal Christian. Um, so that'd be really in interesting. Um, chatting with Testify Apologetics. We're not just an atheist channel here. Well, I'm an agnostic atheist, but I like to have conversations about religion, philosophy, human rights. And then we have um, Chrissy coming on to talk about should we deplatform harmful, harmful ideologies and the people who promote them. So that'd be a really interesting conversation because uh, I got called out by Twitty, uh, got called out by Chrissy on Twitter, and we ended up having a, a, a Twitter beef for all of like thirty seconds, and then um, or thirty minutes, and then we ended up getting on the phone and talking for an hour and a half and became buddies. So, she, yeah. and I was like, you know what, we should continue this conversation. If you want to support this um, channel? Deep Drinks, uh, uh, patreon.com slash deep drinks. And you can see all the Patreon supporters down below here uh, in the um, scrolling bar. Just say thank you to all the people who are supporting the channel. And thank you to everyone who's super chatting. Uh, guys, check out the links. The links for uh, everyone's stuff that we mentioned before is in the description. And thank you so much for coming out. We're going to end on one last comment. Caitlin said um, something amazing. Yeah, I learned that I would fantasize about things that I would never want to do myself. Um, was something I had to talk about with a therapist. And then the therapist told me, well, guys fantasize about being James Bond, but most of them don't actually want to be shot by spies. And that made it click for me. And I was like, yeah, that that that, that works, right? Um, uh, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I'll see all you guys later. Thanks for an amazing panel. Peace. Thank you, thank you guys. Bye.